Well, thank you all for joining us at this Ocean Protection Council meeting taking place here on February 23rd, uh, 2022. We're excited that you're here and we are excited for uh, a great meeting. My name is Wade Crowfoot and I lead our California Natural Resources Agency. And in that capacity, I chair our Ocean Protection Council along with great colleagues uh, who will have a chance to uh, provide updates uh, in just a moment. But I wanted to, first of all, welcome back our state controller, Betty Yi, to the council. Uh, Betty, you have been such a champion on all things related to the coast and oceans, whether it's sea level rise or the blue economy. Uh, for those who don't know, the OPC actually shifts it, uh, a seat between the state controller and the lieutenant governor. And so controller Yi has helped to lead the OPC in the past, and she joins us again as Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis uh, steps away. So welcome back. Uh, Thank you to so much. <laughs> you really excited. And it's a, a lot of the work that you helped to put in motion is being discussed at this meeting. So it's apropos that you're back. So as we hold this meeting here in February of 2022, it's important to note that, it, that a national report was released last week and it was it's called the National Sea Level Rise Technical Report. It reiterates the need for coordinated and urgent actions. And here are some key findings just to set context for our discussion today. It finds that in the next 30 years, sea levels could rise as much as they have in the previous 100 years. Scientists have more certainty than they've ever had about sea level rise projections in the near term through 2050. Um, high tide flooding, what I like to refer to from hearing from somebody else is sunny day flooding, not related to a storm, will increase in frequency uh, with major consequences for infrastructure, communities, and ecosystems if our adaptation measures are not sufficient. There will be a greater acceleration of sea level rise by the end of century and beyond based on our understanding of ice, ice sheets or uh, icebergs in different parts of the world. We're working closely with a specific scientist, Ben Hamlington, who uh, helps lead this work at, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA in Pasadena, who's one of the lead authors of the report to specifically downscale the projections for California to update our state's sea level rise guidance in 2023. So this call to action uh, from our global, our international scientists is really appropriate as we tackle the subject matter today. Today is a meeting of firsts for the Ocean Protection Council. We will consider approval of the first microplastic strategy anywhere in the country, if not the world. Really gratified to see this coverage in, in state newspapers about this today. We'll also hear uh, an update on the development of our first ever state, state agency-wide sea level rise action plan, which is something Controller Yi and others have called for uh, really for years, which is to coordinate our actions across the agencies to support communities across the state challenged by sea level rise. We'll also consider funding to continue to support ocean acidification and hypoxia research and monitoring, and then consider a third round of small grants to advance outreach and education for our marine protected areas, including some gap funding for the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program. So we've got our work cut out for us today. Public comment is obviously important to our meeting. We'll be taking public comment after items four through seven with comment on non-agenda issues on item nine. Really important that we get uh, the public comment specifically focused on each of the agenda items um, when those agenda items are called. We welcome general public comment, not specifically related to any of those agenda items. Uh, and uh, that, would, that will take place uh, uh, on I, 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 item nine uh, toward the end of the meeting. Um, if you wish to make a comment, please raise your virtual hand and our team will unmute you, announce your name, and you'll be available to provide comment. If you've called into the meeting via telephone, which is an important way we provide access, you'll press pound two in order to raise your hand. And depending on how you've accessed the meeting, you may need to unmute yourself. Public comment is limited to two minutes each to enable all of the public comment and all of the work to get conducted here today. Uh, and there'll be a timer on the screen to track your allotted time. 
Anyone interested in providing comment will need to raise your hand by the end of the agenda presentation. Hands raised after that time won't be placed in the queue for comment on that agenda item. So thanks for, uh, thanks for considering all of those ways you can provide public comment. Um, I will next ask, as I probably should have to start the meeting, our colleague, Jen Eckerly, who's our Deputy Director of Ocean Protection Council, to call our roll. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Secretary Blumenfeld. Present. Controller Yee. Here. Council Member Diamond. Here. Council Member Brown. Here. Senator Allen. Here. And Assembly Member Stone. Here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. In just a moment, we'll ask Mark Gold, our, our Director of OPC, to provide his report. But before we do that, I invite our council members to share any announcements or thoughts they have as we kick off our meeting. All right, then let's move into the presentation from Mark Gold. All right, thanks, Secretary oh, Crowfoot. Hey, Jared, Oops. Secretary Blumenfeld. Uh, uh, as a, as okay, an no, let's hear from Mark. I can, I can talk after. Okay. Thanks, Secretary Blumenfeld. Um, so we've all been looking forward to this meeting for, for a long time. There, there's so many important items for California's coast and ocean on today's agenda. Um, I'd like to start by introducing some new staff members. Um, so we have Sarah Stangle. Um, she's joined us from Cal Fire as an administration and finance analyst. And she works with staff on the over 100 ongoing research, pro research project and outreach, um, education and engagement grants that we have at the OPC. Um, she received her bachelor's from Cal State Monterey Bay in business administration. Um, so welcome, Sarah. We also have Elise Goyne as a California Sea Grant Fellow, and she works with the biodiversity team at OPC. She received her master's in marine biodiversity and conservation from Scripps at UC San Diego and a marine bio bachelor's from UCSD as well. She has a very strong climate, biodiversity and education background. And she works on the 30 by 30 um, conservation program for the state, obviously on the ocean side, uh, MPAs and other biodiversity issues. So we're really glad to have Elise with us as well for the next year. And then our second um, Sea Grant Fellow is Megan Williams, and she's part of the OPC climate team, working on ocean acidification, hypoxia, sea level rise, offshore wind, and other issues. Um, she received her master's from uh, uh, Cal State um, Northridge in biology, and her bachelor's from the U in Miami in marine science and biology. She has experience working on climate and coral reef ecology, conservation and restoration. Um, so real great team of people who have, who have joined the OPC staff. Another personnel note is that Caitlin Kalua, our water quality program manager is serving as a provisionally licensed lawyer for CNRA and will be supporting the council today under the supervision of Assistant General Counsel Heather Baugh, except for item six. For that item, Caitlin's the lead presenter as well as the lead author on the microplastics um, uh, strategy and the item before us today. This is an opportunity for Caitlin to meet a significant professional milestone and receive her California bar license under rule 949. Um, so be, be worried that we're gonna have a, a licensed attorney on our staff. I can see Wade laughing already. In other, in, um, in other OPC news, we're making great progress on the development of OPC's first ever tribal engagement strategy, as well as our first ever equity plan. The equity plans benefited greatly from the Environmental Justice Advisory Group guidance and contributions as well from Moy Marino Rivera, the Natural Resource Agency Assistant Secretary for Equity and EJ. Better World Group has been leading the effort along with Maria Rodriguez at our own Ocean Protection Council. We hope to have a public draft out for comment in about two weeks. On the tribal engagement strategy, we have a draft that's nearly ready to share with California Native American coastal tribes. Um, this draft was developed after numerous government to government consultations and listening sessions. Assistant Deputy Secretary of Tribal Affairs, Geneva E.B. Thompson, has guided us every step of the way. She's just been absolutely invaluable. Mike Escrow, the OPC tribal liaison, has been leading the OPC effort. 
Ideally, both of these important policies will be ready for your review and approval at the June meeting. On offshore wind, we're currently in the process of hiring a staff member to work on offshore wind issues, and not a moment too soon. Justine Kimball has been the lead on our efforts to work with other state agencies and the research community to provide the Coastal Commission with the scientific data and data synthesis and analysis they need to complete their consistency determination. The Humboldt Bay lease sale is in front of the commission, I can't believe where time goes, in April. And a lot of the most critical scientific data is coming in just over the next few weeks. So this is an all hands on deck timeframe to give commission staff um, what they need to write a consistency determination that will help ensure that California's offshore wind program will strongly protect and reduce impacts to marine life, fisheries and cultural resources while growing the blue economy. As a reminder, we're talking about floating offshore wind 20 miles offshore or more in nearly um, all of the locations in the two lease sale areas, one off of Humboldt and one off of Central California. And finally, lots of progress on marine protected areas. The MPA statewide leadership team work plan for 2021 to 2025 has been completed and is available publicly. The multi-agency and stakeholder team did a superb job on the plan. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife did so much on the plan in multiple areas, and Tova Handelman was the OPC lead. Also, the MPA long-term monitoring technical reports are now available to the public. There are seven technical reports, and they are loaded with information and data synthesis from nearly a decade of network monitoring and studies. There will be a webinar series with the scientists to discuss the findings in each report in the months ahead. So look out for that. And as a reminder, the decadal management review is scheduled to be completed by California Department of Fish and Wildlife in early 2023. And with that, I'll stop there and pass it back to Wade. Thanks so much. Any questions for Mark? And I wanna give Secretary Blumenfeld an opportunity to share thoughts. Jared. Um, welcome everyone. It's great to see you. Um, two quick updates. One is Anna Neymark, um, who's in the governor's office, um, has taken the uh, role of deputy uh, undersecretary or deputy secretary for water and um, water council at Cal EPA. So she'll be involved in this. And then um, secondly, just to kind of uh, feedback on what Wade and Mark were saying, I mean, this. I feel like today's agenda is the reason that we have an OPC um, and it does two things. It inspires hope and it kind of propels action, which I think are the two big ingredients that the people that I talk to about climate change most often feel is missing. Like, oh my God, like, what can we do? And so for the folks listening, I mean, really, really exciting um, to know that things that bubbled up and, and as we get to those agenda items, I mean, everything that we're doing, whether it's microplastics or sea level rise or any of the work that we're doing on science um, is all about public, you all coming to us and saying, and I remember having these discussions years ago on both of these issues, like, can't someone do something about it? And the OPC is the place that something is happening about it. And I just wanna congratulate all the staff, um, and to your point, Wade, folks like the controller have been pushing this, and Mark and um, Senator Allen, and you know, the entire team has been pushing this for years. And so, often these things like feel like they come from nowhere. Like, oh wow, how exciting! We're doing a big, bold action on uh, microplastics, but it's taken massive amount of science and grassroots advocacy and tireless work on the staff um, and mainly the people listening uh, have made a difference. So just want to thank everyone. Here, here. Thank you. Controller Yee. Um, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Crowfoot, and thank you, Secretary Blumenthal. Um, excited to be back on the council and um, it is um, really, <clears throat> I think, historic and really a testament to Mark and the team for just all the deliberations. Um, it's not just um, that we have plans, but just the, the really significant content of the plans informed by 
just the experiences of so many of our diverse communities around the state and to be sure that we have ongoing engagement with um, many of our most affected communities, including our tribal uh, communities around the state as well. So really grateful for that work. Um, I want to introduce two members of my team because you'll probably be uh, interacting with them more during my year on OPC this year. And that is uh, Christina Kunkel, who's a former Sea Grant Fellow um, specializing in our sea level rise work at the State Lands Commission when she was the Sea Grant Fellow, uh, who is my uh, Deputy Controller for Environmental Policy. Then Evan Johnson, whom some of you may know, who is my senior policy advisor, uh, definitely will be delving into the microplastics uh, uh, strategy uh, as uh, formerly uh, a team member with Cal Recycle. So with that, thank you. Excited to be here. Really excited uh, for your team. That's excellent. All right, then let's move to Liz Whiteman, who, of course, is our executive director of Ocean Science Trust. Thank you, Chair Crawford, um, council members. Um, super brief updates from me today. Um, picking up the thread on the recent new science report on sea level rise, um, just wanted to acknowledge it's really great to see the science advances. Great, not great, right? Um, since we developed the, the Rising Seas report in 2008. And, you know, the, the updated projections and thinking about uncertainties is also matched by science advances on um, how to connect localized projections to adaptation and resilient strategies. So um, standing by looking forward to support next steps um, on that topic. In a similar vein, microplastics um, is on your agenda today. And I wanted to, from Ocean Science Trust, thank the scientists who have continued to contribute their time and expertise to this effort. Just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Yoon Ha Ho from San Diego State University, Dr. Suzanne Brander from Oregon State University, and Dr. Chelsea Rockman from the University of Toronto. We were really pleased to be able to reconvene members of the previous science um, panel to really connect that expertise to the policy conversation. And uh, last, um, I just wanted to touch on and acknowledge one forward looking topic, just because in the last months, we are hearing so many questions from policymakers and lawmakers in California about carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, as folks quickly shorten it, um, and picking up messages from COP and, and elsewhere, the specific role of oceans in carbon dioxide removal, with both technological and nature based approaches. This has been a topic of science study for um, many years, but largely on the fringe. And the science has accelerated dramatically in the last couple of years. So as we repeatedly are hearing questions like, you know, what is it? Should I take it seriously? Should I be paying attention? It's reminiscent to us of the early days of conversations around sea level rise, around ocean acidification, where uncertainties about the science were causing and amplifying concerns about jurisdiction and, and policy making. So we're looking forward to um, engaging on this topic with the experience that an objective science conversation and bringing some of those new advances forward can cut through some of the noise and, and specific interests on that topic. So more soon on that front. And then I'll just close by saying that we're really excited about new work with your science advisory team just launching, launching now um, and looking forward to the year ahead. So that, that's it from me. Thanks so much. And so nice of you to acknowledge the, the scientists that were important in our work on microplastics. It only hit me recently that really as I understand it, California is the first place in the country, if not the world, to have a microplastic strategy. So once again, California is very much on the cutting edge, thanks to the scientists that we're working with. It sounds like from around the world, not only in California. Absolutely. And then I just shared that regarding you know, carbon dioxide removal and sequestration, uh, Secretary Blumenfeld's agency, the California Air Resources Board, is updating its scoping plan this year and for the first time ever is really mapping the path forward to carbon neutrality or net zero. And of course, that's not only about the significant reduction of pollution, but also our ability to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it uh, in different, different ways. So uh, I think that that area of science is increasingly germane. Thank you. All right, well then let's move to our next item and it's item number four. And for those who don't regularly follow our agendas, Every item that we have on the agenda that's an action item or an information item, we link back to our strategic plan. 
It's really important that the council uh, adopted the strategic plan guiding the work over the next five years. So this item is related to our strategic goal, a strategic plan goal number one, which is all about safeguarding the coast in the face of climate change and specifically minimizing the causes and impacts of ocean acidification and hypoxia. So Justine Kimball will present uh, on this item, which is our consideration and approval of the disbursement of funds for projects that improve our, our understanding of acidification and hypoxia vulnerability and impacts. Justine. Great. Um, thank you for that introduction and good afternoon, council members. Um, the suite of four, Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia, or OAH, as I'll be saying, um, presented here today, closes out a funding package that was approved at the June 2021 Council meeting. Next slide. As a brief reorientation to OAH, the California coast is particularly vulnerable to, due to natural processes such as upwelling, seen here as the darker, colder near shore waters, as well as anthropogenic drivers such as local pollution sources and of course mainly global climate change. OAH is a problem because it impacts marine life. Seen here are images from a well-known experiment that show the effect of end of century acidification values on pteropod shells at different treatment lengths. Research is continuing to evaluate how much and when to expect impacts to species and ecosystems. Next slide. In terms of past efforts, addressing OAH is a key priority of OPC's strategic plan, which uh, built on the 2018 California OA Action Plan. The OA Action Plan provided a framework of actions, and since then we've received more specific guidance from the California OAH Science Task Force. These recommendation documents have been presented to the Council at previous meetings. Together with previous investments that are focused on improving OAH models as decision support tools and uh, better coupling of biological and chemical monitoring. The projects I'm presenting here today build on all these previous efforts and investments. Next slide. So more specifically at the June 2021 council meeting, um, the council approved disbursement of up to $2 million to California Sea Grant to fund and administer a competitive solicitation focused on identified OAH research, monitoring, and synthesis priorities and gaps. This funding comes from Prop 68, Chapter 10, which focused on climate change adaptation, including projects that address ocean acidification. Uh, again, this partnership with California Sea Grant was well aligned as it built off both of our strategic plans. Next slide. As I mentioned, the solicitation was open to uh, monitoring research or synthesis projects that met the priorities, uh, which were in response to um, the recommendations from this report from the California uh, Science Task Force I mentioned before. Uh, at the June 2021 Council meeting, you saw those solicitation priorities in detail. Uh, at a high level, the solicitation was focused on filling key spatial and temporal gaps in monitoring, particularly in support of OAH modeling and forecasting efforts, sensitivity and adaptive capacity of key species, and providing synthesized information to uh, stakeholder communities. Next slide. Uh, this is the solicitation process and, uh, and the timeline. As you can see, we had a lot of interest. Uh, the RFP advertised uh, around $2.2 million in available funding, and we received over $18 million in requested funding at the LOI stage and around $11 million in full proposals. We had a, a really incredible technical panel of experts from across the country representing state and federal governments, academia, and research institutions that scored and ranked uh, the 18 full proposals that we received of those, uh, or 16 full proposals that we received. Of those 16, eight were ranked in the top tier. Uh, the four projects that you're seeing here today for consideration of funding were selected based on the scores and the, the thoughtful feedback by the technical panel, discussions with our colleagues at the State Water Resources Control Board, discussions between OPC and Sea Grant, budgetary constraints, and an effort to fund a variety of projects uh, and locations. Next slide. 
So these are the four projects that were selected through this process. Um, I will walk through each one of those separately. Together, the total project costs are around 2.9 million, uh, which includes the Ledbridge funding from California Sea Grant. Next slide. The first project I will be presenting um, fills a critical gap in OAH monitoring off the North Coast. Despite the California current current as a whole being one of the most highly observed ocean regions in the world, observing capacity along the California coast remains sparsely distributed in regions north of the San Francisco Bay, as do the modeling and forecasting services that require such observations. This spatial gap in monitoring coincides with two important patterns that further highlight the need for investment on the north coast. First, the, spar the sparsely populated, predominantly rural North Coast is home to communities that are closely tied to coastal resources as a foundation for their economic and cultural well-being. This creates high social vulnerability to the onset and impacts of OAH in this region. Investment in ocean observing along the North Coast will strengthen state efforts to engage traditionally underserved, under-resourced, and underrepresented communities. Second, coastal waters off the North Coast span an oceanographically distinct transition zone between two regions, the Northern California Current off Oregon and Washington, and the Central California Current to the South that differ substantially. It is likely that the unique characteristics of the two currents in this transition zone underpin the persistent presence of OAH and harmful algal blooms uh, hotspots in this region, which also make the region particularly vulnerable. The map here shows the location of the Trinidad Head Observing Line uh, in relation to OA hotspots in red and um, harmful algal bloom hotspots as well in the, in the map. And so um, that Trinidad Observing Line is, is where this project is proposing to build out um, and enhance uh, measurements. And so that's to sort of orient you geographically. And if you could advance one, um, it'll show another there, another figure there. Uh, there are a lot of technical details to this project in terms of the expanded enhanced measurements that they are proposing. It leverages that already established Trinidad Head Observing Line and proposes to establish a strategically placed mid-shelf mooring, as well as to um, enhance and augment near shore measurements to tie into uh, a, a coastal to, to outer shelf uh, transect line. Um, but the overarching goal of the project is to increase ecosystem monitoring uh, in this area to support the ability to model and forecast the timing, duration, and intensity of OAH exposures affecting the North Coast uh, communities and, uh, and biological ecosystems. Uh, it also includes uh, significant engagement with stakeholders and the development of useful informational products. Next slide. Uh, so this project here focuses on the copper rockfish and uh, will quantify the sensitivity and adaptive capacity of this key fishery species to OAH conditions and will investigate how rockfish offspring respond to OAH based on environmental conditions experienced by their parents as well as maternal size and age effects. Experimental methods include both rearing rockfish in the lab and collection of field specimens. Together, the set of experiments is aimed at improving our knowledge of the ways in which parental environmental conditions and maternal size and age could confer tolerance to OAH in their offspring. In particular, results will be used to evaluate whether, whether the rockfish have the capacity for rapid adaptation to OAH through what's called transgenerational plasticity, which is this non-genetic inheritance you can see there in the figure. And it's a mechanism in which species can adaptively respond to climate change within a single generation. Among, among marine fishes, uh, maternal effects have been documented extensively. However, this mechanism has not been explored in long-lived uh, late to mature species and may be especially important for rockfish and other ground fish in the California current. Finally, the goal is to incorporate the effects of OAH on rockfish reproduction into a stock assessment model. This is a very specialized and novel research with the, which the CSMU team is particularly qualified to undertake. The project will both improve our understanding of OAH biological impacts as well as support climate ready fisheries. Next slide. The next project fills a long recognized overarching need to build out a centralized repository of OAH data and synthesis products, including indicators and status and trends reporting. 
This project will work with a network of diverse partners to establish a statewide information hub and deliver, uh, develop and deliver new curated informational products to ensure data reaches stakeholders in relevant useful formats. Ongoing indicator development will be pursued to communicate patterns and time series of variability and change. As an initial pilot study, they will develop visualizations and indicators highlighting the relationship between OAH and calcifying zooplankton assemblages, especially of larvae of commercially important species. As part of the larger NOAA-supported integrated ocean observing community, SENCUS and their Southern California partner, SCUS, are perfectly positioned both as technical data and visualization experts, as well as well-established PIs in the research community. The outcomes of this project are a really big step forward uh, towards OPC's strategic plan goal of development of an OAH monitoring and observation system optimized to deliver decision relevant information that serves user needs by 2023. Next slide. And the final product uh, project might look familiar uh, as it builds off previous OPC investments in the development of a coupled physical biogeochemical OAH model for the entire West Coast. The model is now considered a state-of-the-art global example. Uh, and in the Southern California Bight, this effort has demonstrated that coastal anthropogenic nutrients, mainly from wastewater treatment plant effluent, are having a significant impact on OAH in this region. At the June 2020 OPC meeting, additional funding was approved to better understand the relative impact of coastal anthropogenic sources and management strategies at different spatial and temporal scales, and to extend this effort to the San Francisco and Monterey coast. Building off these previous and ongoing investments, this project will further develop the biological interpretation and tools to apply current and future o OAH conditions. Uh, dramatic responses to separate OA hypoxia and warming stressors have been observed. However, however, understanding how these stressors interact together to impact species is an important next step. So specifically, this project will develop, validate, and apply multi-stressor interpretation to evaluate marine calcifier habitat compression in response to OAH and temperature in the, in the Southern California current system, um, and apply those to model hindcast and forecast scenarios. Findings from this project were particularly well aligned in providing scientific guidance to the State Water Resources Control Board to inform potential new OAH water quality objectives and nutrient loading standards. Findings will be communicated and tailored to individual management audiences, including the Water Board and Marine Protected Area Managers. Although it went through the same process as the other projects, we are proposing to fund this as a grant augmentation to the existing grant using ALCF. Next slide. So with that, the recommendation is uh, 2.7 million in OPC funding from Prop 68 and ELPF, the Environmental License Plate Funds, for a total of 2.9 million in project funding for these four projects. The 2.7 million requested is higher than the originally uh, approved 2 million in funding for this solicitation, but due to the high quality and variety of projects that we received, we are recommending the higher funding amount. The funding breakdown uh, is a little tricky. Uh, you can see it here in this table, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Justine, thank you so much for that presentation. Before we get to council member questions or comments, I want to invite members of the public who specifically want to speak on this item, um, this recommendation, uh, to, if you're using video, to raise your virtual hand using the button at the bottom of the screen or if you're calling in by telephone to press pound two in order to raise your hand. And if you are calling in by a phone, you may have to unmute yourself. So let's turn it to staff to see if we have any members of the public uh, who want to comment on this item. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. It looks like we have a few hands up. First commenter is going to be Sean Bothwell, followed by Ms. Margaret Gordon, and then Jared Walschool. Sean, you can go ahead and speak now. All right, now you're on muted. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Sean Bopo. I'm the executive director for the California Coast Alliance. Uh, we're here today in strong support for the OPC's funding that will ultimately provide the state water board with the data necessary to protect marine biodiversity and water quality from ocean acidification and hypoxia. Uh, it's important that you know we're supporting this funding because the research for this project will provide scientific support and evidence so that the state water board 
can adopt new, new nutrient loading standards that minimize biological and chemical impacts from ocean acidification and hypoxia. As our staff report states, uh, the State Water Board's 2019 Ocean Plan Review identified ocean acidification, hypoxia, and climate change impacts as one of the five highest ranked issues. This funding directly supports that priority uh, in the 2019 Ocean Plan. While we completely support the OPC's funding of this project, I want to flag for the administration that the State Water Board really needs to get started with the regulatory package and the stakeholder outreach that's going to be necessary to adopt and finalize an ocean acidification and hypoxia water quality objective. The administration's Ocean Strategic Plan Objective 121 states that research for the objective will be completed by the end of this year and that wa the water quality objective will be established by 2025. In my experience of adopting statewide water quality objectives, it takes about a minimum of five years to get something like this adopted. The toxicity policy took 16 years to get finalized. So my ask today is for the administration to make setting an ocean acidification water quality objective at the State Water Board a high priority State Board needs more staff and resources within the Ocean Unit to move forward with stakeholder engagement, to develop a regulatory package that includes the necessary CEQA documentation, and to compile potential expert panels to assess the research and data that is being collected through the OPC's funding here today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Our next speaker is going to be Margaret Gordon. Margaret, you have the floor. My name is Miss Margaret Gordon. I am the, one of the founders and the co-director of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. This report does not include or have, have excluded what is the community engagement, where is environmental justice, where is the equity for orientation and training to under, for the, those who are vulnerable and impacted to understand where you're coming from with this oak oh, oh, with this but this with this process with this with this report. And I feel I see as though no one on the council is from the vulnerable or impacted community to answer the questions or give y'all enrichment around what the vulnerable impacted community are have expectation, expectations of adaptation or resiliency. This is a flaw of this committee so far of having excluded environmental justice, vulnerable and impacted community to be part of the leadership of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Next speaker is going to be Jared. Jared, you have the floor. Hi, uh, good afternoon, council, uh, council. This is Jared Voskel, Manager of Regulatory Affairs for CASA, the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. Uh, CASA represents more than 125 uh, public agencies and municipalities that engage wastewater collection, treatment, recycling, and resource recovery. Uh, we're appreciative for the OPC's initiative to research anthropogenic sources of ocean acidification. And as these efforts and studies are underway, uh, we look forward to assisting uh, as we may with our member agencies in those efforts, as well as understanding what these results mean in terms of uh, policy that's developed at the State Water Board. Um, as, as you need to uh, reach out or to, uh, partner with us to collaborate, uh, we're always ready and uh, here, and we'll look forward to uh, further research on all of these issues and uh, how we can uh, partner with you. Uh, thank you for your leadership, and uh, we'll talk later on the microplastic side. Thank you, Jared. That is all the public comments that we have right now. Thank you, Holly. So then let's bring it back to council members that may have questions or comments on the presentation. I guess the question, sorry, go ahead. I forgot to raise my hand. No, Mike, it's okay. Jared, why don't you go and then I'll, and then Michael will go after you. Um, first of all, really um, appreciate the comments um, that Justine and others made kind of in, in explaining, you know, I think for many people, ocean acidification is a mystery um, and getting real data that can help support conclusions at the State Water Board 
for an other um, fora is incredibly important. So, um, you know, these, as Mark um, Gold reminds us, these are very fast moving issues and we have to be nimble. One of the cool things about OPC is, is the ability to kind of move on a dime and um, start deploying some of this funding to get the research done. Uh, two quick questions, maybe um, either for the team or um, for, for anyone. One was Miss Margaret. Um, it Miss Margaret's particularly uh, amazing in one in many regards, but one of them is uh, community-based science. Um, and I don't know if there's an opportunity, um, having spent some time in Trinidad and the North Coast, for those tribal the Trinidad Rancheria or other community members to play a specific role in helping um, either get trained at Humboldt State or do some of the actual deployment of this OA research. Um, Cause it, I, it's a great training and community building exercise. Um, so that's the first question. And then the second, um, just wanting to make sure that Sean, that we coordinate so that um, we're understanding, and, and I guess this is a workflow question for Mark Gold, but often OPC is the originator of great work that then helps other groups or agencies, in this case, the state and regional boards uh, do uh, rulemaking and standards and just how we make sure that that's all aligned within the budget process so that we have the people um, and understand kind of the workload analysis that these things generate. And I'm particularly eager to make sure that these standards lead to um, real work done by the board. And so look forward to maybe offlining that discussion, but on the specific issue of kind of opportunities for what used to be called citizen science, but I think it's more appropriately called kind of community-based science, how we can engage community members in that work uh, to Justine or Mark or yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on that. Thank you, Secretary Blumenfeld. Um, on the on the um, uh, the equity issues, this is something we're tackling as part of the equity plan. So, um, uh, there definitely are a number of recommendations in that plan that you'll see in in June to do that. We're also working with Ocean Science Trust um, with Liz and and others on trying to figure out how do you get to the point of you you award research. Um, but we ensure that there's diversity in the research teams that are actually working on the research. And so um, we will follow through on that and try to make that happen. Um, these particular projects, as opposed to being, um, you know, we, we use sort of a, a blue ribbon team um, uh, through Sea Grant um, to, to actually do the formal review on the projects. So it, it's not a process that they normally have. Um, to, to take into account um, what was brought up by the public. Um, but we understand how important this is. And so we can, we can try to pursue that. But to that end, um, we are creating specific programs, which you will hear about in depth in June, addressing those exact um, uh, concerns from the public. From the standpoint of working with uh, the State Water Resources Control Board, Everything that OPC has been doing on ocean acidification and hypoxia has been literally hand in glove with state water board staff. Um, and so we have multiple meetings with them. Um, we're both learning from all this research. California has been the leader on ocean acidification and hypoxia research in the entire nation um, with a lot of what's going on. And, and um, that information is now starting to come in um, and, the, and the water board has made um, response to this, as Justine um, mentioned, uh, one of their highest priorities, this isn't going to happen next year. It's probably not even going to happen in 2024. Um, it's probably going to be 2024, 2025, um, in which all of the information is going to be in for the State Water Board to seriously consider what uh, measures may be needed, and it may be regulatory, who knows, um, in um, uh, how do we actually better manage and reduce the harm being caused by ocean acidification and hypoxia, whether it's toxicity impacts or habitat compression. 
Can I add really quickly that actually the, the solicitation um, in the scoring process did have a component of environmental justice in stakeholder engagement, and that was taken very seriously in the review of proposals by the technical panel. Um, and in particular, uh, the North Coast project uh, does have a component of working with uh, tribes and uh, community members. And I was just looking at the letters of recommendation uh, did come from Trinidad Rancheria and the Weo tribe. And it does build on established partnerships between the Sencus team and those tribes in that area in terms of uh, training and uh, actually taking measurements and, and things like that. So that was a really strong point of that proposal. I can follow up with, with more details on it, but it was it was part of that that um, consideration. Thanks, uh, Justine. Justine. Any, any recommendation for future presentations team is like where there's awesome work that like a team member, Justine, like you've done that's around engaging the community and having their support. Maybe just it would be helpful, I think, to have it in the presentation so that the public can understand that support and engagement, because um, this is a, obviously a really important issue. Thanks so much, Secretary Blumenfeld. Michael Brown. Yes, thank you, Sec <coughs> Secretary Crawford. Um, I, I've had a long standing interest in this issue, particularly about the potential for a nexus from, between agricultural runoff um, and OAH issues. I, we are exhausting the available funds that, that we have for um, this kind of research. And I'm wondering, I've got a couple of questions, but the first one is um, af after we, um, uh, issue these grants, are there any significant gaps in, um, in, and that require further research such that OPC or whoever needs to uh, find other sources of funding in order to be able to address them? Or are we doing enough that it is going to, we're going to have a pretty good picture of the OAH, OAH issues such that policy decisions, regulatory decisions, et cetera, can be made and fully supported. Justine agrees, um, but I, I think it's a little bit of both um, in, in that uh, we've gone a long way. In, in filling an enormous number of data gaps, and, and this will do that as well. But as scientists, I mean, there's always a need for more information, right? Because there's so much uncertainty, especially anything that's so climate related, um, and, and we're just learning so much about the field um, each and every week. And um, so uh, we've, we've done a ton. Um, uh, you know, one example, I think, you know, uh, the Justine, uh, you know, really shepherded through is the rockfish example where we, re we, we really had a void of not much going on on the research side on California fish, especially related to fisheries. And so that's why that particular project scored high and was considered that important. Um, and so we continue to do that kind of decision making. Um, so I think we're at a really good place um, in providing um, the State Water Board with an enormous amount of information. Um, you may remember the, the coupled physical biogeochemical modeling efforts that we've been funding here for the last decade. Um, those are coming uh, to their end in the next couple of years, knock on wood. Um, and uh, all this additional monitoring and research will really go a long way to filling many data gaps, but that doesn't mean they're all gonna get filled. Thanks, Mark. I think Liz wanted to get in on this. <laughs> Just to say that I don't think any one funding um, or, or policy entity should even be responsible for funding all of the research gaps. And we've long worked with um, OPC to 
uh, being in coordination, just as an example, when we were looking at ocean acidification and impacts on fishing communities, OPC invested, and then we were able to bring an additional million dollars of federal funding to bear um, to complement the research being conducted by teams um, along the coast. So we are absolutely here to continue that kind of coordination and partnership. Great. Um, my other question is, um, may not be totally on point to these the grants that we're going to consider shortly, but it strikes me that um, we on uh, a little later on our agenda, the microplastics issue, that there is potentially connections between uh, ocean acidification, maybe hypoxia, and microplastics, whether it's around toxicity or potentially mobilization or who knows what, but I, just has any of the OA research been, I'll say in some way connected to uh, marine plastics issues? Or are those things completely separate? And, and I asked this because I, mostly around um, there, the potential for polymers to pick up toxic substances and it, are the ocean conditions, be it increasingly acidified or other, affecting the level of potential toxic substance uptake into uh, polymers, and, I, and I'm not asking. Maybe for, Mark or Justine. Do you have yeah, just to just to, to the be, to the best of our knowledge, um, we haven't heard of any research that that links those two issues at this point. Interesting question, though. Yeah. So at this time, I would invite uh, a motion, and if there is a desire to uh, make the motion. I think it would be a, a move to adopt the proposed findings for all projects as recommended by staff, approve the project as described, and delegate to Director Gold the authority to implement the council's approval. So moved. Secretary Second. Blumenthal. I'll second. Seconded. Okay. Uh, uh, Controller Yee, seconding. Uh, could we have a roll call, Jen? Yes. Uh, Secretary Blumenfeld. Aye. Controller Yee. Aye. Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Great. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks, Justine and team, for that excellent presentation and all the good work. We're going to move on to item five, which is related to our strategic plan goal three, um, which is safeguarding the coast in the face of climate change and specifically uh, protecting and restoring coastal marine ecosystems. This is both an informational and an action item, and it's an update on uh, projects we funded in 2020 for marine protected area small grants and consideration and approval of disbursement of funds for 2022, the MPA small grants program. Tova Handelman, our colleague, will begin the presentation and then turn it over to Dr. Tegan Hoffman, who's the executive director of Coastal Quest. Over to you, Tova. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Sure can. Great. Um, good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and members of the council. As, as you just said, I'm Tova Handelman. Um, I am OPC's Senior Marine Protected Areas Program Manager, and I'm joined today by, uh, with, by the Executive Director of Coastal Quest, Dr. Tegan Hoffman, who will provide an update about these fantastic community projects that are um, finishing up through OPC's Small Grants Program. And first, I'll give you a quick overview about the program. So let's get started on the next slide. Um, okay, so OPC first launched its MPA small grants program in 2018 to fund small scale outreach and education projects that increase marine life associated with MPAs and improve compliance of MPA regulations statewide. The MPA small grants program provides opportunities for local organizations to identify and address the needs specific to the MPAs in their communities. And the outcomes that we're seeing um, from the first two rounds of the MPA small grants program are really an excellent example of just how far community organizations can go with even a modest amount of funding. 
Um, the projects in improved signage at critical entry beach entry points and improved me messaging in outreach products, which can increase MPA literacy, ocean stewardship, and compliance. Some projects created much needed trainings and presentations to increase docent capacity on MPA beaches and at interpretive centers, providing opportunities for local organizations to rise as ocean leaders and increase engagement with their communities. Projects also use strategic targeted and audience specific tools and approaches to expand outreach to stakeholders of all ages and interests. Some products are specifically designed for K through 12 students and use age appropriate language to explain MPA science and what activities are and are not allowed in MPAs. And other products are available in both English and Spanish to reach more audiences, especially subsistence fishermen. Next slide, please. The MPA Small Grants Program is made possible through OPC's longstanding collaboration with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Marine Region Outreach Project and with the nonprofit organization Coastal Quest. Coastal Quest has provided critical assistance to OPC in managing the many pieces involved in running a small grants program, including uh, drafting the call for proposals and the scoring guidelines, facilitating meetings with the grant review committee, providing technical assistance to applicants and grantees in communities entitled to environmental justice, and of course, executing grant agreements and managing grantee reporting. Coastal Quest administered OPC's first round of the MPA Small Grants Program in 2018, which awarded a total of $140,000 of OPC funding, plus an additional $70,000 of matching funds secured by Coastal Quest, for projects up to $15,000 to each of the uh, 14 MPA collaboratives to produce MPA outreach programs. Coastal Quest administered the second round of funding in 2020, which expanded the scope and range of the call for, for proposals. In the second round, Coastal Quest dispersed $750,000 of OPC funds and an additional $150,000 of matching funds and awarded grants ranging $25,000 to $100,000 to uh, 12 community organizations. The MPA Small Grants Program is funded through OPC's Once Through Cooling Interim Mitigation Fund, which prioritizes projects from San Diego to Big Sur. But the matching funds that Coastal Quest secured from private donors allows us to extend the reach from Big Sur to Del Norte counties so that communities statewide could benefit from the Small Grants Program. Coastal Quest also utilized the matching funds to provide critical capacity building assistance to applicants and grantees that represent communities entitled to environmental justice. The round two projects are wrapping up now, and I really must say that the outcomes from this program are better than we could have even imagined from the start. The grantees' creativity, their collaboration with each other and within their communities, and specifically their, their tenacity and ability to problem solve through the difficulties that arose during the pandemic, it's truly nothing short of inspirational. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tegan Hoffman to speak further about the grantees and their fantastic projects. Great, thank you, Tova. Next slide. <clears throat> thank you for the overview of the MPA Outreach and Education Small Grants Program. And thank you, Chair Crowfoot and the Ocean Protection Council for supporting Coastal Quest to administer round two of the program in consideration of supporting a third round. Next slide. For round two, a grant review committee selected 12 grantee projects representing six statewide projects and four projects specifically focused in Southern California. A statewide project focused on California tribes and two North Coast projects were supported also by private foundation matching funds, which we secured. These matching funds enabled communities along the entire coast to participate in the program. Over an 18 month period, our grantees met three times to share tools and approaches with each other. This was really critical to share lessons learned and best practices on a wide range of topic, topics, as well as provide moral support during COVID-19. During these meetings, grantees discussed and shared tools with each other and tips, such as managing Spanish translation of materials to actually sharing in classroom protocols during COVID-19. Next slide. 
round two grantees just wrapped up their projects February 15th and submitted their final reports and, and program materials. We wanted to share a few examples to demonstrate the excellent work and impacts to date. So as you can see on this slide, um, we had actually six projects that focused on K through 12 education, reaching over 4,500 students and over 150 schools, a majority serving Title I schools. Next slide. In addition, grantees develop new curriculums and teacher trainings, setting up and establishing, establishing future programs that will be used for years to come. Next slide. Three projects focused on fishermen, anglers, and boaters. Grantees engage directly with over 5,700 anglers and boaters by providing boater kits and education materials directly to them. We also had four videos that targeted fishermen getting tens of thousands of views through ad campaigns via uh, advertisement magazines and such like Cast and Crank and other forums. Next slide. This video clip I'm about to show you was made in English and Spanish and had over 140,000 unique views. The grantee actually hoped for 5,000 views. It really exceeded expectations um, based on uh, you know, what their uh, proposal was outlining. Anglers. And Next slide. Uh, Harry, do you want me to play the whole thing? It started. Yeah. It started automatically. I can. Yeah. I can reverse it. Okay. Well, I I'm just. I was just really like thirty seconds. I wanted to show. This okay. was translated in English and Spanish, and just um, you know, one hundred forty thousand people viewed it. Let me play it a little bit, and then you can just ping me to stop it. Okay. Okay. And boaters, let's talk about marine conservation in California. Okay, that's great. Next slide. Grantees were innovative with technology. In addition, COVID-19 started at the beginning of the grantee projects. And so we asked grantees to be creative and embrace virtual approaches to disseminate products and for learning. And as a result, grantees reached new audiences and hundreds of thousands of people. As you can see um, in some of these example projects, there were 3D coloring books, um, over 25,000 people downloaded them to date. Uh, we, virtual reality experiences have been created and then people were very creative with the use of social media to promote materials um, with effective ad placement. Next slide. So I'm sharing with you today preliminary results. These preliminary results do not include all of the metrics or all of the grantee impact. We estimate that grantees achieved the following. They reached over 4,500 students and 100, at 150 schools, engaged directly with over 5,700 anglers and boaters, distributed more than 75,000 hard copies in such as the English and Spanish coloring books across communities along the coast, reached hundreds of thousands of key target audiences with targeted ad campaigns, uh, with more than 140,000 people viewing these uh, over five videos, four targeting fishermen and one targeting boaters and anglers, and campaigns such as the Respect Wildlife campaign that you see on the screen here reached tens of thousands of people via Facebook and Instagram, and that will continue throughout the year and beyond. We hope to continue this important program with OPC's approval for round three. We already secured $200,000 in private match and hope to secure additional funding. Thank you for your past support, and we hope it will continue into the future. Great, thank you. We can continue to the last slide here. Um, so building on the successes and momentum of the MPA Small Grants Program, staff recommends the disbursement of $1 million for Coastal Quest to administer a third call for proposals for innovative MPA outreach and education projects. As, uh, Dr. As Dr. Hoffman mentioned, Coastal Quest has already secured an additional $200,000 from private donors to um, provide the capacity building support for communities entitled to environmental justice. Um, should the council approve this funding, we anticipate that the call for proposals for the third round of the small grants program would be released in September 2022, and the small grants would be selected and executed by early 2023, and then finishing 18 months later in 2024. 
This project is aligned with goal three of OPC's strategic plan and the once through pooling interim mitigation programs award guidelines. And this project also addresses statewide objectives identified in the MPA statewide leadership team's work plan and the MPA education and outreach needs assessment. So with that, I'd like to thank the council and Chair Crowfoot for your continued support and especially want to thank all of the partners in the audience today for your collaboration with the current recipients of the MPA Small Grants Program. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tova and Tegan. Really impressive set of grants there. Before we uh, move to our council for any questions or comments, let's open this up to members of the public to comment specifically on this item which again is a consideration of approval, approval for uh, another round of disbursement of funds for the MPA Small Grants Program. Once again, if you are watching on video, please uh, tap that raise hand button on the bottom of your screen to be recognized. And if you're calling in by phone, it's pound two. Holly, I'll turn to you to call on uh, folks from, uh, who want to comment on this item. Right. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. It looks like we only have one commenter. And that's going to be Richard Sadowski. Richard, you have the floor. Hi, uh, Richard Sadowski, Homefront Environmental Justice, Morro Bay. Um, I, I, uh, our group really definitely supports um, uh, uh, the MPA funding the MPA. One of the things, and this uh, with the small grant programs, I just want to share with you some of the frustration that uh you know we have as a group we've we've been applying for small grants since 2019 with the epa with carb with uh uh twice with the epa carb and also you know trying to get funding from the prop one which which we didn't fall into and the challenges that we find is that we're you know, to keep people encouraged, to pe keep people encouraged and informed with uh, with ocean acidification and with you know the focus on MPAs, it's really difficult when you kind of lose uh, momentum or any kind of encouragement from you know trying to get funding for our projects. One of the one of the things that would really help is if um, you know, like the previous speaker mentioned, Margaret, uh, giving the opportunity to, um, you know, making the grant process a little easier and trying, uh, trying to, you know, using groups that collaborate, uh, that collaborate with the universities and, and um, anyway, I, you know, one of the things is I'm, I'm, uh, I just find it a little frustrating to keep trying and, not succeeding with some of these programs because uh, you know uh, at, at the end of the day, you know you can only self fund for so long, and then and then you you know you just don't have the means anymore. Thanks so much, Richard. Just it want to confirm. Like, Sorry, Holly. It looks like we had one more hand go up right after I said that. Um, so we have a caller with the last. Four digits seven seven eight nine. You have the floor. Good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot and members and staff of the Ocean Protection Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Caitlin Sprofera, Program Manager and Evaluation Specialist for the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation. On behalf of CMSF, I would like to express our strong support to authorize funding for the third round of the MPA Outreach and Education Small Grants Program. We commend your investments in programs like this, which create opportunities for public engagement and community leadership while raising awareness of the MPA network. Previous small grants program projects have provided invaluable support for education and outreach initiatives, engaging thousands of students, community members, and ocean recreationists. CMSF was one recipient of round two funding, and with the generous support of OPC, we developed a four-part video series for recreational anglers. This project helps establish strong, trusted relationships with crucial angling communication channels and ambassadors. The series reached over 375,000 anglers and perceptions of MPAs improved with video release, a clear indication the videos resonated and opened important communication channels. 
Without small grants funding, CMSF would not have been able to forge these invaluable relationships that elicited positive interactions and engagement from one of the most critical audiences for compliance. CMSF's 2021 outreach evaluation highlighted the need to create unique content specific to target audiences and reach them through already trusted channels. We encourage continued commitment to raising awareness and stewardship of the MPA network through innovative means. A third round of the MPA Small Grants Program can bolster outreach initiatives and meet needs well into the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, let's turn it back to the council to see if there are any questions or comments. Only one quick comment based on public comment, which is, uh, and just kind of went to the, to the issue and it kind of, I think be useful to do. So uh, Cal EPA has a EJ small grants program, which has grown. It was a $1.5 million a year grant program and the legislature funded it 25 million for two years. So really doing a huge amount of work. CARB also has small grant programs um, as Richard mentioned, and we have this MPA program. So what I'd suggest is those three programs or maybe there's others certainly probably within CNRA we could host um, a workshop on how to successfully apply for the grants and maybe have a few of the grantees talk about how they approach the grant uh, application uh, so that we can have some successful examples um, and provide that to the community and um, the I think the programs are similar enough that we could probably uh, get quite a lot of public interest in that. So happy for us to help organize that um, with Tova and Tegan and others. Jared, excellent idea from my perspective. And as you know, we both sit on the Strategic Growth Council and we're prioritizing on the Strategic Growth Council, building capacity and providing technical assistance. So more groups can actually access the government funding and it's not so complicated. So your suggestion around a workshop a shared workshop among those three programs, I think is a great one. And hopefully Tova and team uh, and Tegan can, can follow up on it. Jordan Diamond. Thank you, Secretary Kofoid. Uh, I just wanted to voice my support generally, but also just call out and commend Tegan and Coastal Quest and generally for the 30% of matching funds that were provided in previous rounds and the already 20% of matching funds that prioritize communities entitled to environmental justice funding. Um, and just really emphasize the, I know that's, that's private funding that you're raising and pulling in for that, which is a, a critical part of this. Yeah, great, well put. Michael Brown. Um, also just a, a really great program. Um, I, I want to just uh, ask um, from OPC staff perspective, I've over the years kind of been um, reiterating the need for evaluation of pro how programs are, uh, wh whether they met the um, stated goals and uh what what can you take away from them uh, given dr hoffman's recitation of some of these great grant projects I, one of the things i'm concerned about is you kind of it, it's easy to lose track um of successful effort, successful efforts that you can then apply going forward. And I, I think um, while there is institutional knowledge, while people are still on staff, you know, staff rotation and stuff uh, means you kind of tend to lose, tr lose track of what works and what doesn't. And if there's a way to, um, build some institutional capacity for maintaining um, a, a kind of what's the track record of um, the actual uh, projects, as well as the ways of administering the grant programs and, 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 and the funding 
process, um, I think would be helpful in the long term. Thanks, Michael. So, Tegan or Tova, are you are you evaluating the effectiveness of individual collective grants that inform you know future grant making into the into this third round? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, that was um, a suggestion that um, Michael Brown had made in a previous for the second round as well. So we made sure to um, incorporate that in this second round. And um, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, um, she is currently working. She and her team are currently working on uh, the wrapping up the final metrics and everything for this second round because these projects just finished. Um, so the that wasn't uh, ready for us to present to you today, but um, in the final reporting, uh, that will definitely be a part of it, not just metrics and, and stats for uh, all of the impact and, and outreach that has occurred, but also um, lessons learned, especially given uh, the um, COVID-19 pandemic and how uh, the, the grantees had to shift significantly their original um, ideas, you know, to make up for the fact that some of these programs weren't meeting in person. So there's a lot of great um, lessons learned there on how to do these types of projects uh, in a way that, you know, reaches your intended audiences, audiences but also um, expands beyond that. Um, and then also just general um, grant uh, administration lessons learned as well. So that is something that will be in the, in the final report. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I mean, we've been keeping track of some lessons learned on the RFP process and feedback, as well as the administration um, and, and, and lessons from grantees, which I, I think has been really great. But I, I did want to also highlight that with the private dollars, we are we did in round two and we will again for round three, we offer technical assistance to organizations and we and we do outreach as best we can to invite um, meetings with us and we can help with proposal writing. So I invite anyone um, on this call and to share um, you know, with your community that you know, we can help with that proposal writing. We can help think through design of programs um, if that's something you want. And so we offer that in round two, we'll be offering it um, if we're supported for round three. And um, you know, that's a that's a big piece of, of the focus. And then we front the dollars um, for the grantees, which I think is a, a big piece, um, not getting paid in arrears and having the hold on funds. Well, thanks so much for answering Michael's question. And Tova, appreciate you integrating his feedback from the, the previous round. At this point, would like to entertain a motion for approval of disbursement of funds for the 2022 MPA Small Grants Program. I'll move, so I'll move. Controller moves. Second. Okay. Uh, Jordan Diamond seconds it. Uh, Jen, can you call the roll? Yes, uh, do we still have Secretary Blumenfeld? You do, and I say aye. Thank you. Controller Yi. Aye. Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the good Thank work you. on this. Looking forward to the next round of grants. Let's move on to item number six, which is one of the main acts of our meeting here today. This is another action item that is, focuses on that goal number three of our strategic plan, protecting our coast and marine ecosystems and communities in the face of climate change specifically focused on improving coastal and ocean water quality. And we talked about this at the top of the meeting. This is the first ever microplastic strategy in the country, if not the world, and we're excited to hear about it. I do wanna uh, recognize as Jared did, Assemblymember Stone and Senator Allen, so much leadership on this topic of just tackling the scourge of plastics pollution is coming from the legislature. So I think you know this work builds on that leadership. So with that said, we uh, I would ask Caitlin uh, Klua to present here. Caitlin, congratulations on your double duty as attorney and uh, architect of this strategy along with Mark Gold. But I think Mark is actually gonna set the frame. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, 
Just to echo what was said uh, earlier by Liz Whiteman, I, I just think it's important for the item itself is to thank the scientific advisory um, mycoplastic risk assessment panel members. Um, this was what Ocean Science Trust put together with the risk assessment. Um, and, and specifically, there were a few members, University of Toronto's Chelsea Rockman, Oregon State's Suzanne Brander, who sort of went above and beyond in helping us put together uh, the final strategy. Um, Steve Weisberg at Squirp, um, as always, um, is, is available to help, and he was great on this. And then um, something that, that uh, Secretary Blumenfeld, uh, you really have a gem there in Scott Coffin at the State Water Resources Control Board. That guy knows more about microplastics than anybody in the entire state. Um, so he's, he's pretty amazing um, and was very, very helpful there. Ocean Science Trust staff, I think this was a labor of love for them um, in really helping us um, on this project. And I, I really think it's some of the best work that they've done for the OPC. And then of course, our own OPC staff um, uh, with uh, Caitlin, who's about to per present. Um, Holly Wire um, uh, started this for OPC. And then uh, obviously um, Justine, as well as Jen Eckerly um, uh, put a tremendous amount of time and effort into this as well. And I also want to give props to the, all the state agencies that thoroughly and extensively reviewed and commented on the strategy. The strategy would not be what it is without, you know, the help of State Water Board and Cal Recycle and DTSC, um, et cetera, et cetera. It was just so critical um, to putting together that, that strategy. Um, and you've already heard the platitudes, so I'm certainly not going to talk about, you know, those sorts of things. But we know microplastics pollution problems are growing exponentially, and the latest science continues to shed light on the scope and scale of the toxic impacts to marine life and human health. Um, and so I'm not going to spend more time on that. I'm just going to pass it over to Caitlin Kalua so she can make the presentation. But we're really excited about moving forward on this strategy. Thank you. Let's see, just going to pull this up. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Caitlin Kalua, Water Quality Program Manager, presenting on item number six, the statewide microplastic strategy. Thank you so much, uh, Executive, Executive Director Gold, for the perfect intro. Um, next slide, please. OPC developed the statewide microplastic strategy as required by Senate Bill 1263 to increase the state's understanding of the scale and risk of microplastics in California's marine environment and to identify early actions to ma manage microplastics. The statute requires OPC to develop this strategy by December of 2021 and to report findings and additional recommendations by December of 2025. Next slide, please. Senate Bill 1263 requires the following elements, including a prioritized research plan, standardization of methods, and a risk assessment framework that are embedded in the final statewide microplastic strategy. Next slide. The strategy incorporates the microplastics definition adopted by the State Water Resources Control Board in 2020, which defines microplastics as polymers with chemical or other additives that are at least three dimensions and one nanometer to five millimeters in size. Microplastics also fall into two general categories, primary mi microplastics manufactured intentionally at a small size, for example, pre-production plastic pellets or microbeads in personal care products or secondary microplastics that fragment from larger plastics. Next slide, please. It is important to recognize the amount of research and knowledge we have gained since SB 1263 was adopted in 2018. Research completed in the San Francisco Bay has identified urban stormwater as a primary pathway of microplastics into the bay, with wastewater also a known, while smaller, contrib contributor of microplastics into marine waters. Research in California has also identified tire and roadwear, cigarette filters, single-use plastic foodware, and synthetic textiles as among the top sources of microplastics in California waters, sediment, and fish tissue. Following this study, there's an overarching need to evaluate microplastics in agricultural soils, the biosolids from wastewater treatment plants, and aerial transport. There's also an overarching need to identify trends of microplastic pollution in other regions of the state. Next slide, please. Foundational to the strategy was the OPC Science Advisory Team's initial risk assessment framework released in spring of 2021 which recommended a precautionary particulate management approach to microplastic pollution and emphasized upstream pollution prevention as the most effective response, given it is difficult, if not impossible, to remove microplastics once they enter in the environment. Concurrently, the State Water Resource Control Board and the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, known as SWERP, have recently identified preliminary thresholds for aquatic life, recognizing the harm caused by the ingestion of microplastics. Next, next slide, please. 
The final strategy was informed by these findings, resulting in a two-track approach that recognizes the need to take decisive precautionary action now, as scientific knowledge and understanding of microplastics continues to grow. The statewide microplastic strategy provides a multi-year roadmap with 22 recommended early actions and 13 research priorities that will allow California to take a national and global leadership role in managing microplastic pollution. Recommended early actions fall under the following three categories, pollution prevention to eliminate plastic waste at its source, pathway intervention, such as stormwater and wastewater to intervene with the mobilization of microplastics, and outreach and education, which I will discuss, uh, discuss in further detail. Next slide, please. Pollution prevention can decrease plastic in California's waters with recent results from the Southern California Regional, sorry, excuse me, the Southern California Bite Regional Monitoring Program showing a significant decrease in the presence of plastic bags between 2013 in 2018, likely due to the statewide plastic bag ban implemented in 2016. Similarly, the strategy encourages comprehensive statewide plastic source reduction, reuse, and refill goals with the elimination of specific single-use plastic products that are not readily recyclable and are otherwise known to contribute to microplastic pollution. This includes expanded polystyrene, intentionally added microplastics to consumer products, and single-use single tobacco filters and other products. Next slide, please. Economic strategies may also be used, as, such as advancing extended producer responsibility or promoting in, improvements in household appliances, such as washing machines and dryers, that have a demonstrated ability to reduce microplastic emissions. And critically, the strategy proposes five targeted sector-specific workshops to be held over the next two years to identify comprehensive and actionable solutions to reduce microplastic pollution from vehicle and tire roadwear to prevent harm caused by tire shedding, synthetic textiles to reduce microfiber shedding, agriculture to transition to less plastic dominated practices, evaluating alternative products and materials for single use foodware and packaging, and solutions to prevent microplastic pollution from fisheries and aquaculture. Next slide, please. Second, the strategy emphasizes pathway interventions as a priority to intervene and prevent microplastics from entering California's waters. Improved stormwater management has multiple benefits to improve the health of California's waters and communities from a range of pollutants, with solutions that include supporting green infrastructure and low impact development and evaluating microplastic removal efficacy of specific stormwater management methods. Compliance with existing discharge prohibitions of trash and pre-production plastics known as nurdles and intercepting plastic debris located in high use beaches, recreational areas and encampments ad adjacent to waterways. Next slide, please. Wastewater recycling and facility upgrades also provide multiple benefits to reduce the discharge of microplastics and other pollutants into ocean waters and to augment local water supply. Action should also be pursued to prevent the proliferation of microplastics in the byproduct of wastewater treatment plants that can potentially then enter the environment and impact soil health if, if applied to agricultural field as a biosolid. OPC has a current study to evaluate the removal eff efficacy of microplastics in wastewater treatment plants, which may provide additional recommendations to manage microplastics that enter wastewater facilities. Finally, aerial transport of microplastics has yet to be comprehensively assessed in, with initial studies demonstrating the use of condenser dryers, improved dryer filtration, or choosing to hang dry clothes in lieu of using a dryer as one approach to reducing airborne microplastic fibers. Next slide, please. Finally, the solutions track outlines actions related to outreach and education to engage impacted communities, raise awareness of microplastic pollution, and to facilitate systemic change. Next slide, please. The second track of the strategy outlines research priorities that call for coordinated simultaneous, simultaneous investments across four main areas. First, monitoring, risk threshold, thresholds and assessment, sources and pathways prioritization and evaluating new management solutions to inform future action. Next slide, please. Priority research to advance microplastic monitoring include the creation of standardized methods, acquiring lab laboratory accreditation to ensure methods are employed properly, and creating a statewide monitoring network as well as future monitoring requirements. Next slide, please. California has a preliminary risk assessment framework and increased data can help the state identify the habitats or communities that may be most affected by microplastic pollution and provide insight as to which management actions are most needed to reduce microplastic exposure. Next slide. Additional studies are needed to assess pathways not yet fully studied in California and to identify statewide trends that can then identify these local management needs. Finally, completion of these research priorities will provide California with the additional insight to provide further recommendations within four years by December of 2025. 
Next slide, please. The draft strategy was released in December of 2021 with a public comment period that ranged from December 21st of 2021 to January 21st of 2022. OPC received over 120 written comments from nearly 160 individuals and entities that largely fell under the following categories, including support for uh, pollution prevention and true source reduction, requests for a risk-based versus precautionary approach, requests for sector-specific strategies, including significant comment calling for the reduction of synthetic textile production and the promotion of natural fibers, support for specific research priorities, and an overarching need to promote equity and community engagement. Next slide, please. The final microplastic strategy was revised to elevate equity, public transparency, and early community engagement, and incorporated recommendations into the action-oriented sector-specific workshops, and clarified the timeline of specific recommendations, among other smaller clarifications throughout the document. Please note that the final strategy was updated, updated and uploaded to the OPC uh, meeting webpage just this morning. Uh, that includes an, an editorial adjustment specifically identifying the need to evaluate the toxicity of additives and dyes for all textiles, not only natural fibers on page 13. So I do want to flag that we do have an, a final updated version on the, on the website currently. Next slide, please. OPC staff worked with state agency partners from the Interagency Plastic Pollution Steering Committee that included representatives from both California Natural Resources and California Environmental Protection Agencies and OPC staff especially appreciates the contributions made by the California Ocean Science Trust, its advisory, its advisory board, um, SWERP, and SFEI in developing this final strategy. Next slide, please. The final statewide micro, microplastic strategy will inform state agency partner actions and OPC investments over the next four years with staff committed to using these findings to inform additional recommendations to the legislature by 2025. Staff will return to the council for approval of funding for implementation of specific priorities and of the strategy later this year. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Caitlin, thanks so much. And I anticipate we'll, we'll have a good discussion among council members on this, but first wanna to turn to members of the public who are interested in providing public comment, either by clicking on the raise hand button if you're watching by video or pressing pound two if you're joining by phone. Over to you, Holly. Thank you. Our first speaker is going to be Sean Bothwell, followed by Miho Laguerre, and then Emily Parker. Sean, you have the floor. Good afternoon again, council members. Sean Bothwell for the California Coastkeeper Alliance. I want to applaud the OPC for developing the first comprehensive microplastic strategy in the world. Uh, you know, microplastics is not an easy water quality pollutant to tackle, uh, but I think this strategy is a good first cut at tackling that low-hanging fruit. I wanna start by thanking the OPC for the inclusion of Objective 2A25, which prioritizes trash services for trash hotspots. These hotspots are areas outside of the scope of the State Water Board's trash provisions, yet they generate significant amounts of trash that discharge directly to our waterways, ultimately breaking down into microplastics. The trash provisions at one point contained uh, trash hotspot provisions, but ultimately those provisions were removed to focus on the MS4 systems but with a commitment from the State Water Board to develop a trash hotspot program in the future. Seven years later, the State Water Board has not made any meaningful progress towards its commitment to develop a trash hotspot program. So we strongly recommend that the state move forward with this OPC recommendation to develop a trash hotspot program, or at the very least for the administration to consider a three-year pilot project to fund a cost share program between the state and local municipalities to partner with NGOs to address trash hotspot cleanups. Uh, second, I want to thank the OPC for including green infrastructure and stormwater capture as a strategy for capturing microplastics. California should be doing everything it can to promote stormwater capture as a tool to use stormwater as a resource rather than as a pollutant nuisance. Uh, we should be removing the barriers to stormwater capture, increasing stormwater funding for projects, and revitalizing our stormwater permits to incentivize stormwater capture as a means toward attaining beneficial uses. One low-hanging fruit that I want to flag is the, develop, the potential development of a statewide commercial stormwater permit. Our commercial zones are currently unregulated source of stormwater. So think of Costco's or Amazon fulfillment centers, areas that contain large parking lots with impervious surfaces that cause pollution from cars, toxic metals, oils, gas. Um, they run off into the MS4, ultimately becoming the municipality's problem and liability. And the state can design a commercial stormwater permit, incentivizing building green infrastructure on site 
or for commercial facilities to pay into a municipal fund that helps build regional stormwater capture projects. I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Next speaker is going to be Miho. Miho, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and Council Members. My name is Miho Laguerre and I'm the Plastic Pollution Policy Manager with the Surfrider Foundation. We appreciate OPC staff, the council members, and the Ocean Science Trust work on this important topic. Thank you for incorporating many of our comments that we submitted along with the Center for Biological Diversity and the Clean Seas Lobbying Coalition last January. In particular, the Surfrider Foundation is happy to see that there was more emphasis on source reduction and implementing a more comprehensive and holistic approach to reducing microplastic pollution. We also appreciate the acknowledgement that plastic pollution is a climate and environmental justice issue and has detrimental impacts throughout the life cycle, especially on low-income communities and communities of color. We were pleased to see the OPC prioritizing the engagement with local and vulnerable populations, and this engagement will be critical for the success of this strategy. And regarding policy recommendations, we support the solution to enact comprehensive statewide plastic source reduction, reuse, and refill goals by 2023, and look forward to supporting OPC to reach this goal. We encourage funding to help support pilot projects, as well as systematic changes towards refill and reuse. And in order to make source reduction and comprehensive solutions stronger, we encourage OBC staff to look at the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. One major theme of this act is on source reduction of plastic bags from foodware, plastic straws, utensils, and produce stickers. And this bill should be used as a blueprint for California as it's the product of years worth of intensive stakeholder outreach and input and only includes successes experienced at the state and local levels. Finally, thank you for adding additional detail on the implementation, which will be important for follow through and accountability. So overall, we are pleased with the revised version of the statewide microplastic strategy and appreciate all the hard work. We look forward to staying engaged and working with Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you, Miho. Next speaker is going to be Emily Parker, followed by Emily, I'm sorry, followed by Ricky Erickson and then Hoyan Ip. Emily, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot and council members. This is Emily Parker. I'm the coastal and marine scientist with Heal the Bay, an environmental nonprofit based in the LA region dedicated to keeping our local waters and watersheds healthy, safe, and clean. As a leading member of the Ocean Protection Council's Ocean Litter Strategy and an organization that has worked to fight plastic pollution for over three decades, I'd like to thank the council and staff for their continued dedication to tackling plastic pollution and specifically the extremely complex issue of microplastics that we're facing today through this state microplastic strategy. Along with dozens of other organizations, we contributed to written public comment submissions on the draft microplastic strategy earlier this month. And we're very glad to see the updated strategy document and the additions that reflect our recommendations and greatly improve the strategy. Particularly, I'd like to thank council and staff for including increased transparency, community engagement and equity components to the strategy. And we're also especially glad to see the inclusion of comprehensive plastics source reduction strategies in objective one, as the initial document focused too closely on individual plastic products. Finally, I'd like to thank the council for also adding additional technical solutions and clarifying the microplastics research priorities in this final document. Microplastics are an extremely complicated issue. They're difficult to track and study, difficult to remove, and most importantly, to prevent. This strategy will provide much needed guidance to state agencies and local jurisdictions to move forward on solutions that will prevent microplastic pollution, such as local efforts to reduce plastic foodware currently underway in LA County and LA City that Heal the Bay is working closely on. Heal the Bay strongly supports the microplastic strategy and the phased two track approach for pursuing both early action and additional research to inform longer term solutions. We're very much looking forward to working with the council and partner agencies to implement this strategy. And I'd like to thank you for the, uh, your time today to provide comment. Thanks so much, Emily. Next speaker is going to be Ricky Erickson, followed by Hoy and Ip. Ricky, you have the floor. Unmute. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and members and staff of the Ocean Protection Council. I'm Dr. Ricky Erickson, Marine Program Director of the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation. We commend your two-pronged approach on pollution prevention and pathways intervention, coupled with education and outreach to improve coastal water quality. 
we feel that OPC's microplastic strategy is a tremendous bold step forward. We were happy to hear that Caitlin speak to the issue of agricultural plastic pollution. CMSF is leading scientific research on agricultural plastic pollution in watersheds, partnering with Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, UC Cooperative Extension, local growers and researchers to conduct trials of biodegradable mulch in place of traditional plastic mulch on strawberry fields. We are also working with agricultural products, recyclers, manufacturers, educators, and the Nature Conservancy to increase removal and recycling of irrigation drip tape from fields. In addition, we want to hop, highlight the opportunity that California's more than 400 harbors and marinas represent as strategic front lines for plastic pollution delivery. We are currently launching the Blue Waters Alliance. This is an alliance that will represent a high profile public private collaboration between key stakeholders, including brands, marine operators, retailers, coastal conservation agencies, NGOs, manufacturers, and service providers. This alliance will help facilitate the adoption of water quality pollution prevention equipment using the latest innovation and technology in harbors and marinas. Through offering access to equipment, funding, education, outreach, and research, the Blue Waters Alliance could also help lead the ocean recreation community to take action in protecting our coastal waters. We look forward to partnering with you on this and other challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erickson. Next speaker is Hoyan, followed by Amy Wolfram, and then Jennifer Fearing. Hoyan, you have the floor. Good afternoon. I'm Hoyan Yip, Sierra Club, California Zero Waste Committee. Council and the staff, I really, really want to thank you for your leadership on this, um, with this microplastic strategy. And I particularly want to thank Caitlin for her willingness to communicate with us over and over during this process. Now, we cannot agree more that without consistent targets or comprehensive requirements to reduce plastic pollution, California remains limited to addressing plastic pollution and waste on a single item or single jurisdiction basis. Many cities actually are proud how much money they spend on cleanups, trash capture devices, and infrastructure. There's even some competition on greenwashing ordinances or plans. If they had the courage to mandate, refuse, reduce, reuse, so much money can be saved and used towards homeless programs and other EJ projects. Well, some of them actually don't know what EJ is. I am concerned about the goal of zero trash by 2030. Just about everyone's talking about 2030 from zero trash to zero carbon. Without interim targets and enforcement, Plastic pollution, climate change, and environmental injustice can only get worse because business as usual is the habit of those with the power plus uh, lobbying by corporations. So um, this has been a wonderful process. Um, many NGOs on our side have collaborated for public comments and, um, um, and I know many state agencies work on this together. So. Let's keep collaborating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hoyan. Next speaker is Amy Wolfram, followed by Jennifer Fearing. Amy, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Amy Wolfram with Monterey Bay Aquarium. The aquarium's mission is to inspire conservation of the ocean, and we continue to urge action to address the significant threat of ocean plastic pollution. We appreciate the important work the OPC has done on this issue, including this statewide strategy. Recently, the aquarium's chief conservation officer, Margaret Spring, led a study by the National Academy of Sciences on the US role in the global plastic pollution problem. The report emphasized that a range of interventions are needed, beginning with reducing plastic at its source. We appreciate that the findings of this study are included in your microplastic strategy as we see California leading the way to get this done in the United States. In particular, we are excited to see the focus on source reduction included in the pollution prevention objectives to enact 
statewide plastic source reduction, reuse, and refill goals by 2023, and to prohibit the sale and distribution of expanded polystyrene foodware and packaging by 2023. We also support the actions to increase research to better understand sources and pathways of plastic pollution, and to increase education and outreach to communities and businesses on how to be part of the solution. The aquarium is also supporting a precedent setting plastic pollution initiative that will be on the ballot this November. The initiative called the California Plastic Pollution Reduction and Recycling Act is consistent with and will complement the new strategy and will help implement the National Academy's recommendations by setting a new single use plastic reduction mandate and increasing the role of industry in supporting source reduction, reuse and recycling. Thank you, Senator Allen and Assembly Member Stone for endorsing this ballot measure. And thank you to all council members and staff for this new microplastic strategy. We urge the council to adopt it today. Thanks, Amy. Next speaker is going to be Jennifer Fearing, followed by Heather Podol and then Jared Boskul. Jennifer, you have the floor. Thank you and good afternoon. This is Jennifer Fearing on behalf of Oceana and Ocean Conservancy. We are enthusiastic about the statewide microplastic strategy and urge the council to adopt it. We are pleased to see the strategies proposed plastic pollution reduction objectives and recommendations. In the last 10 years of the international coastal cleanup in California, volunteers have collected more than 1.5 million pieces of microplastics from California beaches and waterways. That's why we appreciate the strategy's call for additional research to inform future policy efforts and investments, but agree that immediate action should be taken to quote, move with the urgency this moment calls for. And we urge OPC and state partners to take the, defense, the decisive precautionary actions to address microplastic pollution that the strategy includes. Indeed, we are actively engaged um, along with our allies in efforts to enact comprehensive statewide plastic source reduction, reuse and refill goals by 2023 and to prohibit the sale and distribution of, it, of expanded polystyrene foodware by 2023. Both Oceana and Ocean Conservancy also want to thank Senator Allen and Assemblymember Stone for their early endorsements of the California Plastic Pollution Reduction and Recycling Act, which will be on November's ballot. We support immediate action to pursue further outreach and education, similar to OPC's investment in the reusable California playbook, robust investment in refillable and reusable incentives, infrastructure and behavior change will be necessary if we are to succeed in durably reducing the production use and pollution caused by single use plastic packaging and food foodware. And finally, at least three recently introduced bills are aligned with the strategy as well. I'll just highlight those. AB 1690 by Assemblymember Rivas proposes to ban single use tobacco filters and devices and single use e-cigarettes and vaporizers. AB 2026 by Assembly Members Laura Friedman and Bill Ting is co-sponsored by Oceana, CalPerg, and Environment California and would phase out single-use plastic packaging associated with online shopping. And finally, thank you, Council Member and Assembly Member Mark Stone for authoring AB 1724 to continue the effort to address problematic microfibers that are shed by washing machines. We look forward to partnering to implement this strategy and thank you for your focus on this urgent matter. Thanks, Jennifer. Next speaker is Heather Portal, followed by Jared Boskul. Heather, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Heather Podal, uh, Advocacy and Partnership Coordinator for FiberShed, a California nonprofit working to build regional natural fiber textile systems that support ecosystem and community health. First, a huge thank you to the Ocean Protection Council members, staff, and partners for supporting the important research and frameworks in this microplastic strategy document. OPC has outlined ambitious and actionable policies to reduce single-use single plastics in California, and we now need the same rigor to be applied to solutions for plastic clothing and textiles. We appreciate your emphasis on source reduction as the highest priority for reducing microplastic pollution. With your risk assessment framework prioritizing microplastic fibers for their abundance, polymer types, and morphology, next steps must include specific strategies for source reduction of synthetic textiles. We need systemic solutions beyond laundry filtration and other pathway interventions. We need coordinated multi-sector engagement across state agencies to develop new economic incentives, producer responsibility regulations, and investments in infrastructure to reduce textile waste and support natural fiber textile systems in California. We're grateful to see these topics included for further investigation. As a partner with connections across the fiber and textile industry, 
we look forward to collaborating and supporting the development of specific actionable next steps. Secretaries Crowfoot and Blumenfeld, Senator Allen, Assemblymember Stone, and Controller Yi, we hope you will carry forward a priority for supporting healthy, climate-smart natural fiber textile systems in California into your work across agriculture, natural resources, circular economies, and economic development. California can be a global leader linking circular economies that reduce textile waste and reduce greenhouse gas emissions with natural fiber systems that build soil and ecosystem health while reducing microplastic emissions. And we thank you for your work to achieve that. Thank you, Heather. Next speaker is going to be Jared Boskul, followed by Nick Lapis and then Ms. Margaret Gordon. Jared, you have the floor. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Jared Boskul, Manager of Regulatory Affairs on behalf of CASA, the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, uh, CASA was the organizational sponsor in 2018 of Senate Bill 1263, which required the OPC to develop uh, the microplastic strategy. And we would like to compliment the OPC for your vision and guidance in the strategy to protect California's coast from microplastics pollution. Uh, we're supportive of the strategy and appreciate your team's accessibility to discuss its development to ensure its efficacy. Additionally, our members have been actively working to collect samples for the OPC's associated study on wastewater treatment removal effectiveness. Uh, and they've had a front row seat for this emergent scientific field and we're grateful for the invitation to collaborate on that project. Uh, finally, earlier this month at, at a national conference, I heard from partners in other West Coast states as well as colleagues around the nation. And they were all just beginning to look into these matters and uh, share that they're watching and following California's leadership. So a big thanks and congratulations are due to your team for this bold plan. Uh, we look forward to continuing partnering and supporting your efforts over the next few years and in the lead up to 2025 for that report to the legislature with further policy recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Next speaker is going to be Nick, followed by Ms. Margaret Gordon. Nick, you have the floor. Hi, good afternoon. Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. Uh, most of what I wanted to say has already been echoed by some of our NGO partners, but I did want to specifically express uh, appreciation for all the work that went into this. This really is a comprehensive document that covers uh, most of, of, the, of the intervention opportunities we have when it comes to microplastics. And we're incredibly grateful for the work uh, that uh, each of the commissioners has done as both a, a OPC commissioner, but also in their individual capacities on this issue, but uh, especially grateful for the work of the staff and, and specifically uh, Caitlin and Holly. W one area that um, I think could use a little bit more work and uh, it, it is touched on briefly in the document, but I think could use a little bit further refinement is looking at more upstream solutions to textile, uh, textile based microplastics. We know that different clothing sheds differently and that manufacturing decisions uh, have a great deal of impact on whether or not an individual product is a major source of plastic microplastics or plastic microfibers, I apologize. And we really need to move to a system where uh, manufacturers are required to meet specific sheddability requirements before they can sell a product. That seems like the next logical choice to look upstream and at the producers and not only work on downstream cleanup of the, of the microfibers once they're emitted. And again, this is mentioned in the report, but I think it could use a little bit greater focus. Thank you again for all your work on this. Thank you, Nick. Next speaker is Ms. Margaret Gordon, followed by Charlene Schmid and then Joanne Brash. Ms. Margaret, you have the, you have the floor. Thank you for letting me speak. Ms. Margaret Gordon with the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. We have known over 50 years of five generations that plastics were not the most protective thing for our health. And we have not, where is the legislation to say that the business and the industry have to change its process to have biodegradable plastic. 
We have lived with plastic on multiple products, productions for many, many years. And I'm not understanding why this should not go back to that industry to protect the people of the state of California and other communities. I am really concerned about the data did not address environmental justice as who is being most vulnerable and impacted. And also, how do we, how do we do the activism to change the overall use of collective plastics and all products. Because everything that we consume at some level has plastics. And we I didn't hear how the this would be addressed for the future generation of my grandchildren and my grand my great grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Next speaker is going to be Charlene, followed by Joanne. Charlene, you have the floor. It looks like we lost Charlene, so we're gonna move on to Joanne. Joanne, you have the floor. Thank you. My name is Dr. Joanne Brash. I'm a special projects manager for the California Product Stewardship Council. We're a nonprofit funded by cities and counties in California, who support extended producer responsibility as an effective measure for hard to manage products. We wanna thank the OPC and the stellar staff that worked on this microplastic strategy. And we appreciate taking the input from the comments and adding details to the final strategy. Microplastics are traditionally out of scope for an EPR program. I am currently the chair of the carpet and the mattress stewardship advisory committees under CalRecycle. And I have been asked not to discuss microplastics, even when the pollution resulted from program activities. CPSC is leading four textile projects that are publicly funded. And what we are finding is that the sheer volume and cost of establishing a textiles program is too expensive for cities and counties to take on alone. And so we believe that textiles is a good next product for extended producer responsibility after packaging and the other um, sources of microplastics. Today, we ask for the OPC's I vote, and we encourage innovative approaches to engaging the industry and delineating funding from the industry to solving the problem. CPSC leads the Ocean Protection Council's working groups, and we are meeting tomorrow to discuss state and local policies related to ocean debris. We invite everyone to attend, and again, thank the OPC and the stellar staff for the strategy presented today. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Next speaker is going to be Genevieve, followed by Steve Antel. Um, Genevieve, you have the floor. Oh, and we lost Genevieve now. So we have Steve. Steve, you have the floor. Steve, it looks like you're muted. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on. It looks like we were able to get Genevieve back. Genevieve, you have the floor. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. I lowered my hand a smidge too soon. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot and council members. I'm Genevieve Abaddon and I represent the Clean Seas Lobbying Coalition, a coalition of organizations throughout California who are all dedicated to upstream plastic pollution solutions. We were Happy to be at the forefront of helping to pass Senator Portentino's SB 1263 and are thrilled to see the microplastic strategy come to fruition. We acknowledge and appreciate all of the time and energy that has been put into it and strongly support the emphasis, uh, particularly on engaging First Nations and community and frontline organizations early on to ensure equity and inclusion as well as the mention of Upstream's reusable California playbook and emphasizing the need for solutions that are comprehensive in nature and that focus on source reduction and reuse first and foremost. Thank you so much for your leadership on this. We urge the council to adopt it. 
And we look forward to continuing to work with you and all of our allies in the legislature and on the line on implementing this very important and groundbreaking strategy to address microplastics. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. All right, and I still have Steve's hand up, so I'm gonna try him one more time. Steve, you have permission to talk. If you want to make comment, please unmute yourself. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to Scott Coffin, followed by Robert. Scott, you have the floor. Scott, it looks like you're muted. Please go ahead and unmute. All right, so let's go ahead and try Robert Vandehoek. Robert, you have the floor. Hello and good afternoon, uh, council members. <clears throat> I'm a conservation biologist and applied ecologist, and in my research uh, and readings, I learned that some of our European countries uh, are leading in microplastics uh, research, but also um, politics and implementation. I think uh, countries of Italy, France, and some of the countries in the Adriatic Sea uh, um, have been in that lead in that research. And I'm curious to know if California is um, adapting, adopting it or um, learning anything from um, European leading societies and governments there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is just reemphasize uh, the really good public comment by uh, Heather Podal on natural fibers. And I think that is a, a major solution. And I'm wondering if there could be some discussion or for the public to learn about how the, you know, I imagine natural fibers are sort of like uh, have an opposition from oil refinery corporations and their lobbyists that want to continue with, you know, using plastics um, and how we end the subsidies or the helping we do of the oil, taking the money that we give to the oil refineries uh, and switch that over to natural fibers uh, support. Um, just, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Okay, that is the last of our public comments for this. Well, thanks so much, Holly, for facilitating that and all of the really good public comment. Clearly, there is a groundswell of support for more action to reduce plastic pollution and compliments to the OPC team for enacting the will of the legislature in developing this strategy, obviously supported by our agencies and Governor Newsom as well. I'll turn it over to council members for questions or conversation uh, as we consider uh, approving or adopting this strategy. Senator Allen. Yeah, I'm obviously excited about it. Uh, very good. Um, obviously, this is the strategy, but uh, but 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 absolutely uh, a step in 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 the, in the right direction, and and a, and, a, and a, I think a reflection of how seriously we're starting to take this issue. So I'm very excited. I, I mean, obviously, in the in the course of our negotiations over 54 and the conversations about the ballot measure, um, I mean, just in general, we need to focus on source reduction. Um, you know, I, I would I would also say we need a, a you know, state funding to jumpstart a reuse system, uh, you know, funding new reuse infrastructure. Uh, so I'd love to love to work with the members on 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 what that might look like. But um, but obviously uh, glad to, glad to see us taking this important step forward on what is really becoming a scourge and, and an enormous problem for our uh, for so many things, including our ocean. Thanks so much, Senator. Uh, Controller Yee, and then we'll be followed by Assemblymember Stone and Michael Brown. Right. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crawford. Um, first, um, just uh, adding my thanks to Caitlin, the team, uh, the entire staff, and so many who uh, just informed this report. Um, and I'm really pleased with the um, all the comments that were received as well that um, really made this final version, I think, um, just a wonderfully comprehensive approach to reducing plastic source pollution, but also highlighting the material specific bans that are to be pursued um, as more comprehensive programs are being established. Um, I just want to maybe give voice to some um, 
concerns, not with the report, but just as we kind of look at the next critical phase of, of the work. And, and um, I would say that, um, you know, certainly the uh, objectives for enacting comprehensive statewide plastic source reduction, uh, reuse and refill goals by 2023, um, prioritizing the interception of trash and plastic uh, debris with um, just the whole uh, focus on trash hotspots is uh, critical. Um, and then also the extended producer responsibility, uh, additional information supporting that is, uh, I think, also an improvement. Um, I guess where I'm, I'm uh, and I want to really add my thanks to Senator Allen and Assemblymember Stone and um, those who have actually worked on the ballot measure, because I do think we need a little bit of, um, pressure is not the right word. I just want momentum to continue. And, and by that, I mean, as we look at particularly with, um, engaging uh, the industry and uh, really welcome the idea of the workshops uh, with respect to identifying alternatives. Um, but workshops to me also sometimes signal kind of slowing of progress. And so I wanna be sure that, um, you know, there are mechanisms in place that just uh, really continue to keep pushing this forward with the urgency that uh, we all recognize this to be. So uh, that's kind of my, my first set of comments. Um, secondly, I did, um, want to just ask about the um, question that um, the commenter, uh, Margaret Gordon kind of raised for me. And that is, uh, there seemed to be, um, as I read this, the one, the, the one aspect of the report that did give me some pause was a statement about how um, vulnerable communities uh, may be at greater risk um, from microplastic pollution. And I guess I'm, Wondering if, if is that not is this disputed or still um, is it still disputed or is that undisputed? It, it seemed uh, a little soft with respect to our focus on vulnerable communities and um, just uh, if if it's not disputed, I would just ask if we could just think about strengthening that, that a little bit. Um, we don't really address vulnerable communities until um, a good way into the report, but if it is undisputed, I would like to see something addressed, you know, really early on around that. Um, so that um, it is uh, really recognizing that uh, our um, vulnerable communities are, are uh, really one of the reasons why we need to move with um, uh, greater urgency. And then lastly, what I would say is, um, I hope that as we continue to engage with industry, uh, that one of the strategies may be with respect to outreach and education, kind of a broader strategy that um, hopefully brings in other uh, other parts of our private sector and business community that um, yes we're engaging directly with the industry with respect to alternatives but I think every I mean every sector of our economy has a stake in this and uh, I'm hopeful that I mean I, I think about you know whether here in California we can even have our own uh, plastics pollutions coalition and engaging some of our sister agencies outside of the resources and Cal EPA uh, realm so that we can begin to continue to build momentum and awareness frankly broad public awareness um, I know in other venues in which I said we are trying to tackle this issue with respect to some of the large companies and its use of plastics, but um, I'm just uh, hopeful that this becomes uh, much more of an engaged uh, issue for um, other businesses as well as they realize uh, that this could ultimately result in a, a bottom line business economic risk to them. So uh, I would just encourage us to think maybe outside of our own community, uh, the ones who have been involved in establishing and, and uh, really uh, putting out this fantastic report and think more broadly with respect to broad economic impacts. Thank, Thank you, you so much for all of those, all of those insights and suggestions. Assemblymember Stone. Thank you. The, the challenge with plastic pollution and addressing it has always been that the, the forces that are that are pushing back always want us to rely on the cleanup side and the, the, the back end. And that falls on the taxpayers, it falls on the individuals and not on upstream within the economy where the real money is and, and the real possibility for some solutions are. And that's why approaching any plastics policy more as circular economy or producer responsibility is, is going to be critical. With microplastics, however, and, and fibers and all this, the, I think the, the challenges are even more insidious. And that's why this statement and the ability to build the science and the policy 
from an important document like this, and I'm certainly hoping, I'm assuming that it will pass today, is ultimately going to be critical because as we've tried to address microplastic issues in the legislature, the lack of science and the lack of understanding of how a lot of these microplastics, these move through the economy, move through the environment, move through the various systems that are set up, has led to a lot of finger pointing and the ability just to sort of driven the, the inaction. So this report is going to be absolutely critical for us to then be able to leverage into policy and to be able to move forward. And how we would do extended producer responsibility, how we would do sort of source reduction becomes harder here when it is difficult often to identify the source of the microfibers. And so the, where, the, path, where the, the report is talking about pathways and all of these other attributes that need to be addressed so that we're not looking at the back end in the environment and how we now, what we do now with these microplastics in the environment, but every step along the way that puts them into the environment and creates the vulnerabilities that we're talking about has to be what's on the table. That's really what this report lays out is the need to look at all of those components. And every place we can, we can work to take microplastics out of the possibility of getting into the environment has to be realistically looked at, or we're gonna, we will constantly be fighting a very difficult battle without solutions. And, and they're too easy for those who are responsible to point fingers in other places and, and not take any further responsibility. This is what's so insidious about such a small and pervasive ubiquitous type of pollution that's out there. And it's been very difficult to even have conversations like around cigarette filters, which are a, a real source of ultimately of the microfibers, the way that those filters break down, let alone textiles, things that are very popular in our culture those are gonna be hard shifts to make. So whether we're talking about washing machines or dryers and filtration at those sets, uh, updating and looking at how we do better water treatment, how we deal with stormwater runoff and with the, the look now at, at what stormwater runoff and other sources of what had been seen as wastewater as future su supply, a critical supply ultimately for Californians we can't wait in putting together policy and figuring out how we clean these up and make sure that we are addressing the, the, the pollution at every step of the way. That's what's gonna be difficult about it. And I will tell you, as someone who's tried to push some microplastics through the legislature, the lack of the basis that OPC is creating here has just allowed too many people to look the other way and say, oh, it's not ripe yet, we don't know enough. And yet you can look at this, the burgeoning science and where they're finding microplastics. We, can't, we cannot wait to, take, to start to take policy steps that are going to force ultimately some solutions and some, some better directions. So this is a very critical step for us. It is good for California to be one of the first jurisdictions to be willing to take this step. I think that's important. But for us also to make sure that we are pushing on what policies need to be and what changes need to be looked at as we're moving forward are ultimately going to be critical. So I'm hoping that this is not a statement now, but this ultimately becomes a living document that changes with the science, changes with the policy background, changes with developments that are coming up, and this becomes really the... The, the beginning for us to be able to build significant policy. So staff's work on this is absolutely incredible. It, it's, a, it's a great document. I'm very appreciative of how it entertained, took into account all of the public comments up to this point. But I'm also hoping that, that this then not just becomes the, the baseline, but an ongoing document that allows us to continue to have conversation around around policy because we can't we've got to be taking steps now and having conversations about those steps figure out what's right what's wrong and where we can be shifting perspective and and really building the case for shifting some of the responsibility to those who can afford to help us solve some of these really serious problems throughout california so congratulations on a great report 
And I'm looking forward to a successful folk here and then being able to build policy off of this document. Well put. So much work to come. Michael Brown. Um, I first off want to thank Caitlin, the entire staff, Assembly, Minor, Assembly Member Stone and Senator Allen and all the other electeds as well as um, all, all the folks who both commented here at the um, meeting and I went through all 200 and almost 50 pages of comments on the written comments. Um, you know, this, this issue is as, as Assembly Member Stone has just said, it, it, it is core to what OPC is about, but it's also just core to our society, not just here in the US, but globally. Um, the nature of plastics is endemic to our modern culture. It's, it's just something that is everywhere. And the, um, the potential for this strategy is it can help set a standard, not just for what we do here, but almost globally. And it's actually for the strategy to be successful, it's gonna require global change. Not telling you guys anything we don't already know, but it, it is a global world in terms of where, how plastics um, that affects us here, uh, it's embedded in the, in, in the global economy. I, I wanna make a few comments um, about things to watch out for as we go forward with the strategy. The first is um, the notion of uh, in an effort to get rid of things that result in uh, microplastics, that end up in marine environments or wherever they end up. If we're not care, we have to be careful that we don't make regrettable substitutions. Um, an example of one came about when we um, turned to, a, to when BPA, bisphenol A, became an issue, and BPA and all were which is a um, ingredient in polycarbonate, um, a, a uh, thermosetting plastic. Um, manufacturers went, oh, okay, great. We'll just get rid of BPA. And they turned to other bisphenol product uh, substances for which there wasn't any evidence of harm at the time and ended up over products switching over and ended up um, as more as some studies were done, those substances were just as bad as BPA. And there's another, another number of examples where that has occurred where there is an absence of information. We, I'll say we, uh, whether it's um, corporations or just society as a whole, we've turned turned to things where because we don't know of harm, we're good to go, but we actually didn't have enough evidence to say, oh, there isn't going to be any harm. And so the potential of saying, no, we don't want to see uh, expanded polystyrene is there may be other substances that get substituted, but we should proceed with caution. The second issue is um, an extended producer responsibility. I, in concept, great, we should do that. Um, deciding who is actually the producer though, isn't always straightforward. 
Um, is it the retailer? Is it the brand? Is it the actual manufacturer? Is it the material supplier? Um, it could be all those things. But one of the, the two aspects of it is EPR presume, in, in my understanding of EPR, and there's, there's lots of issues that ha have been researched on it and whatever, but the hope is, is that manufacturers, if they're forced to take responsibility at the end of life or, or at some point in for a product after its use value is over, that they're either gonna manage it correctly or ideally redesign their products so they don't have to deal with it at the end of their life. And the evidence so far is that doesn't always happen. So if we're gonna create EPR policies, we need to create them in a way that we get the outcome we expect to get. The second aspect, uh, or third aspect maybe of EPR is where it has been successful, it appears that the, there is some value of those material, of that product or the materials that are left from the product such that um, you can either recover it and recycle it and, or uh, do whatever you're gonna do with it. But if it doesn't have enough value, um, it ends up just being, if it is actually collected, it ends up just going to a landfill or places that have uh, incineration. And that is just displacing the problem from one uh, location to another, from the marine environment to a landfill environment. Um, so the next, the next thing, wanna, sure. I don't want to cut you off, but I want to, we do have to read about a huge item after this. So I just want to, uh, to uh, potentially summarize what you want to share. Okay, great. So two more things. Um, one, I, I think the research pro research side is great, but I'd like to suggest that we need to beef up um, research on policies uh, that not just the, I'll say the science part, but on policies that will get um, one innovation, two outcomes that we want to see. And then related to that, as this implementation of the strategy goes forward, which I'm going to, I know. Mark, you're thinking of this, and Caitlin, you think of this, but think of this as adaptive. We need adaptive policies. We need to be able to change when um, when we see policies that aren't we aren't getting the outcomes we want to see, and shift rather than just say, okay, you know, we're stuck with this policy. Got it, Michael. Thank you. And boy, we could we could spend so much more time talking about this. I just want to uh, make sure we have time for our next uh, topic, which is on sea level rise, another simple, fairly straightforward issue. Um, look, for me, I'll just kind of close it off by saying it, it's to me, it's not rocket science. You know, the that graph that Caitlin showed that demonstrated that between 2013 and 2018, plastic bag ban in California resulted in significantly less plastic you know, in plastic bags in the ocean seems intuitive, but it's so powerful to have the science behind it. And I think that's where Assembly Member Stone and I think Senator Allen are going is they've, sometimes it probably feels pretty lonely in these conversations without the ba basis of strategy and science. And so I'm excited about the, the, uh, the, the strategy here today, but clearly it's not mission accomplished. It's, an, it's a point of progress and it's a journey ahead, but boy, what a collective failure uh, uh, on everybody's part, if we can't take such a straightforward issue uh, and address it in California of all places, you know, the birthplace of 
conservation and the modern environmental movement. To me, this is an area where we should absolutely be leading in California. And I know that we're all committed to that. And this just energizes me um, you know, more than ever to really breathe life into this strategy and do what we can on the OPC in partnership with the legislature and our sister agencies, governor and so many others to actually you know, walk the walk. We know what we need to do. Let's go out and do it. So with that said, I would entertain a motion to adopt our microplastic strategy uh, as the first ever of its kind uh, for the for the Ocean Protection Council. So move. Second. All right, Michael. Second. Controller second. Uh, Jen, can you call the roll? Yes. Oh, and I should I should welcome our colleague uh, Anna Neymark. Uh, Secretary Blumenfeld welcomed Anna before she was able to join, but she serves as a Deputy Secretary for All Things Water at Cal EPA. So welcome, Anna, and she'll be uh, representing. Uh, Cal EPA for the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, I will start with Council Member Neymark. Uh, we'd like to vote to approve. Thank you. Controller Thank Yee. You. Aye. Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Huge thanks to everybody that joined us and provided public comment. We, you know, probably all would have said it, but this movement is really built on the work that's happening outside of government, uh, across, you know, communities in California and beyond. So huge thanks to your work and keep up, keep up the, the good work. We'll next move to the last sort of uh, large item of the meeting, and that is an informational item uh, specifically related to. Uh, our strategic plan goal uh, of protecting the coast from climate change, building resilience to sea level rise, coastal storms, erosion, and flooding. And this is the first of its kind, first ever really, state agency sea level rise action plan. And I'm just giving a little bit of context before uh, Mark presents. It was almost two years ago when three coastal commissioners came to me and came to us at our agency and I'll name names, it was Donna Brownsey, Dana Bochco, and Sarah Amanzada. And they said to us, you know, listen, we've got a real problem. We're seeing sea level rise manifest in the work of the Coastal Commission, and we're having to address sea level rise on a permit by permit basis. And there's been some good work uh, on understanding the impacts of sea level rise in California and starting some, some state agency actions, but we are desperate for more alignment across agencies and frankly, more broad action. And that catalyzed me and Mark and Jen and others to bring together a range of agencies from across state government to align around a set of sea level rise principles, which you've heard about, which was sort of the first step in the journey uh, that brings us to today, which is actually uh, a, a set of actions in the form of an action plan that we have identified across state agencies that we need to be responsible for supporting communities across our, along our coast that are faced with this challenge of sea level rise. So Mark, really excited to hear from you and to, from Ella today on what this action plan does and what it means for California. Thanks, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, I'll just build on what you said. I mean, the fact that we had 17 different state agencies and departments collaborating to develop the action plan. I mean, that's just, that might be the bigger precedent than actually what's going on on sea level rise, if you really think about it. And, and um, really the level of effort um, put in by all of those departments and agencies was extraordinary. Um, and the action plan itself is organized around the seven sea level rise principles that you talked about. Um, and I, I just really wanna um, highlight the work of the Ocean Protection Council team. Um, you're gonna hear from Ella McDougall, um, who's really spearheaded bringing this to the finish line. Um, and then former uh, California Sea Grant fellow, Kat Beheshti, did some extraordinary work on this. Uh, Justine Kimball and Jen Eckerly helped make the plan happen and work closely with all state agency partners. So it really was an incredible effort by everyone. Um, but I also want to thank the governor's office and Department of Finance for really in record time um, uh, reviewing uh, this really important document. Um, and providing comments 
and uh, and basically supporting um, this effort, um, which I, I think is is really important to get their buy in to what we're doing here today. So it's not just the 17 different agencies; it really is the whole state um, that is moving forward on what we need to do as state agencies to work together to try to make the entire coast of California resilient to sea level rise. And with that, I'm glad to pass it off to Ellen Dougal for the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, and good afternoon, Chair Kropa and Council members. My name is Ella McDougall, and I am OPC's Climate Change Program Manager. I work closely on all issues related to sea level rise and coastal resilience, and today I will be presenting the State Agency Sea Level Rise Action Plan for California, known more simply as the Action Plan, as an informational item and discussion piece. And in a few brief words, the Action Plan is a collaborative roadmap for coastal resilience and sea level rise in California for the next five years. Next slide, please. Why are we so concerned with sea level rise? While drought and wildfire may be two major climate impacts that Californians face today, sea level rise is a, gro a growing climate impact with substantial financial, public safety, and natural resource implications. Seas will continue to rise at an accelerating rate, threatening our coastlines, communities, coastal habitat, and critical infrastructure. And the impacts we may face include flooding, erosion, extreme high tides, and worsening coastal storms. And two specific examples that we already see today are king tides and bluff collapses. And these impacts place our safety and livelihoods at risk. That said, the state of California has sound science and guidance to begin planning for sea level rise and coastal resiliency. Next slide, please. As discussed previously, a national sea level rise report was released last week that iterates, reiterates the need for urgent and ambitious action. Projected sea level rise over the next 30 years could rise as much as was already observed in the past 100 years, showing remarkable acceleration. The updated likely projections show just under one foot by 2050 and slightly less than 3.5 feet by 2100. The report presents a reduced range of uncertainty for projections, allowing us to be more confident in our planning targets. And perhaps more critically, we expect a rapid increase in the rate of sea level rise and the number of sunny day floods by the year 2035, which will cause repetitive and costly damage. Next slide. One of the easiest ways to measure the benefit of addressing sea level rise early and robustly is by determining how much money we will save on future damage and repairs. One analysis found that with 1.7 feet of sea level rise, $17.9 billion worth of commercial and residential buildings may be at risk of inundation. Additionally, San Alijo State Beach currently loses $59,000 of revenue and 4,320 visitors each year due to eroding and disappearing beaches. And near Gleason Beach, a one mile section of roadway that is subject to chronic bluff erosion will need to be elevated and realigned and will cost Caltrans $40 million. We can also quantify impacts in terms of our coastal habitats and natural areas. It's possible that 31 to 67 percent of Southern California beaches could erode by 2100 if no interventions are performed. And a study done by State Parks and the Coastal Conservancy found that with five feet of sea level rise and a hundred year storm, 593 state park structures, 150 parking lots, 93 campgrounds, and 65 miles of access roads will be at risk. Next slide, please. It is fairly well known that underserved, low income and marginalized communities referred to collectively within OPC as communities entitled to environmental justice carry more of the burden of climate change than other communities. Toxic Tides, a recent study from UC Berkeley and UCLA analyzed how sea level rise will impact contaminated sites and found that at least 440 hazardous facilities, including power plants, refineries, industrial facilities, and hazardous waste sites are at risk of coastal flooding by 2100 under a high emission scenario. These toxic sites are five times more likely to be located within one mile of communities entitled to environmental justice, meaning that these communities will bear heavier consequences of climate change and sea level rise than other communities. 
And with this data and research in mind, we are working to ensure that coastal resilience and sea level rise efforts are equitable and just, including especially funding and community outreach. Next slide, please. This is a major call to action, and we are here to act. In the past few years leading up to this effort, the state has made impressive strides towards sea level rise planning and adaptation. In 2019, OPC released the sea level rise guidance to guide local decision makers on planning and prioritizing for coastal resilience. In 2021, the Coastal Commission put together comprehensive guidance for adapting critical infrastructure for sea level rise, focusing on specifically transportation and water sectors. State parks released the sea level rise adaptation strategy to address the urgency of sea level rise planning for their coastal state park units, which account for a quarter of the coast. And BCDC also recently released their Bay Adapt Joint Pat Platform, an initiative to establish regional agreement on sea level rise action. In late 2021, exciting sea level rise legislation known as SB1 was passed and signed into law by Governor Newsom. This legislation prioritizes sea level rise through planning, education, and technical assistance. And in the same year, it was a busy year last year, significant funding was allocated to coastal resilience in the state budget. And this includes 100 million to OPC, 500 million to the Conservancy, 30 million to the Coastal Commission, and 11.5 million to state parks. Next slide, please. To make collaborative efforts work, widespread input and participation are needed. And this occurred through the Sea Level Rise Leadership Group, which was just mentioned. And this group is an energetic and hardworking group of 17 state agencies, all listed here. With quarterly working group meetings and biannual executive committee meetings, this group guides statewide sea level rise action and policy for the state of California. Next slide. In 2020, OPC published the principles for aligned state action to address sea level rise. These principles were forward thinking and push the envelope on action and funding. The principles are as follows, best available science, partnerships, communications, local leadership and local conditions, alignment, coastal resilience projects, and equity and social justice. Next slide, please. After adoption of the aforementioned principles, the Sea Level Rise Leadership Team Executive Committee tasked the working group with the creation of an action plan that would showcase how to implement these principles. With leadership from OPC, a year's worth of working group meetings, individual one-on-one -on -one agency and OPC meetings, and several sets of comments and feedback, the action plan was developed. It is truly, in my opinion, an example of how to take climate research and data and policy and turn it into statewide action. Next slide, please. In this action plan, you will find around 8 80 agency-specific actions that span all seven sea level rise principles. They include items as diverse as research to nature-based solutions to policy initiatives to communication efforts. Overarching goals were developed to help us understand how to focus our efforts, and those goals include items such as coastwide adaptation plans, funding mechanisms, preserving and restoring habitats, and ensuring equity and justice is utilized throughout coastal adaptation tactics. In order to show accountability and success, the actions in this plan are tied to trackable metrics. These include what type of deliverable or outcome is expected with each action, for example, a newly adopted policy or a report, which agency will lead or support the completion of the action, and an intended deadline for the action. And these measures will help us keep on track with this action plan. Most actions apply to a statewide scope, but some are developed in specific for Bay and Delta regions. And as you can see in the principles, an entire section of the action plan is designated for equity and social justice actions pertaining to sea level rise. To designate which actions are considered the highest priority, because there are over 80 of them, about 20 were listed as critical. And this helps us understand what is most vital to pushing the envelope on coastal resilience. And these critical actions are already funded or have funding in the pipes with the upcoming budget. Next slide, please. Following this meeting, we will open public comment for the action plan. Please send your comments to the below email address, sea level rise action plan at resources.california.gov. 
We will also coordinate with our sister agencies to introduce the action plan at their public meetings. OPC and the Sea Level Rise leadership team will also embark on a tribal consultation process to ensure California Native American tribes have their voices heard and integrated. And finally, as a quick reminder, this is a living document. Not only will we accept public comment, but as agencies progress on their actions or adjust their timelines, et cetera, we will modify the document. OPC and Sea Level Rise leadership team will continue to meet and assess our progress and report out annually to this council. And last slide, please. I'm excited to showcase this plan and thank you to all of the Sea Level Rise leadership team agencies for their hard work. They participated so continuously throughout the past year, we would not be here without them. So thank you. And with that, I welcome the public's comments followed by council's discussion. Thank you. Thanks Ella for all your work. Ella did an incredible job with Mark and Jen wrangling uh, all of our agencies and uh, and ourselves to get this to a place where we can share it publicly and get comments on it. So big thanks there. I've got some thoughts, I imagine others do too, but let's hear from any members of the public that wanna comment on this item. And that is of course the Sea Level Rise Action Plan. Over to you, Holly. Thank you. At this time, I only have a couple of hands up. First is going to be Suzanne Cumming, followed by Jane Velez, and now Phyllis Griffin. Uh, Suzanne, you have the floor. Um, good afternoon, Secretary Profoot and Council members. My name is Suzanne Cumming. I'm a member of Sierra Club and Defend Bayona. Uh, and I'm concerned about the bulldozing plan because uh, you're about nature-based solutions. Uh, on page seven of your plan, it says, quote, nature-based solutions are the preferred method for sea level rise adaption. Coastal habitats, including wetlands, beaches, and dunes should be protected and conserved. Adaption planning and implementation should prioritize conservation of coastal habitats and maintaining biodiversity and associated functions, including allowing space for upland and inland migration of coastal habitats, unquote. Here on the Los Angeles coast, the state has a project that is not in compliance with these overarching goals at the Bayona wetlands. We know the state has spent a great deal of money attempting to get this project permitted, but new sea level rise predictions make this project one that needs a big mid-course correction. Please withdraw the current plan. Although the EIR states that the development of sea level rise adaption will be part of the next phase of design refinement. Adaption using the correct sea level and flood control figures needs to happen before certification so that people can comment on the actual project that they're going that is going to be done. Please decertify the flawed EIR and reissue a revised draft EIR so we can comment on it and look closely at our 20 point plan and nature based solution. Thanks so much. Thanks, Suzanne. Next is going to be Jane Velez, followed by Phyllis Griffin. Jane, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, I live right at the ocean's edge in Marina del Rey. And I must say respectfully, your own presentation just now about the threat of sea level rise and the need to preserve habitat and wildlife form one of the best arguments yet against bulldozing the Biona wetlands, which sits at the ocean's edge and is home to 1,700 species, including threatened and endangered species who have nowhere else to go. Digging enormous craters with bulldozers and destroying existing protective levees over the course of a decade is just not a smart way to protect this area against sea level rise. The errors in the plan's flood assessment is precisely why the Army Corps of Engineers has withheld its stamp of approval of this plan and why there are about six lawsuits against it currently. Your expert just spoke about the toxic sites, including oil facilities near the ocean's edge, 
posing an extraordinary risk of spewing toxic waste in a flood. There is, as we all know, a huge gas storage facility owned by SoCal Gas deep underneath the wetlands. It is similar to the Aliso Canyon facility, which blew about five years ago, creating one of the worst ecological disasters in California history, considered worse than the Exxon Valdez oil spill. This is why the LA City Council and other nearby municipalities have voted in favor of closing that SoCal gas facility. And I just respectfully urge you to consider that that is what needs to be done, not bulldozing this one square mile of ecological reserve that was supposed to remain pristine for the flora, the fauna, and the wildlife. The nature-based solution is to allow that to remain and give it tender, loving care. I do appreciate you having opened the Fiji gate. We already have communities, including communities of color, marginalized communities, and children visiting and enjoying the wildlife. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let me just mention that we are committed to hearing from uh, all community members, members of the public on any topics that impact the coast and ocean. And that's why at the end of our agenda, uh, every meeting, we have a specific time for public comment on non-agenda items. It's critically important for us to get through the work of this council that the comments, the public comments on each item as we go through the meeting are specifically focused on the agenda items being discussed. So really do appreciate your respect and collaboration on that. Next speaker. Next speaker is going to be, oh, we lost Phyllis, is going to be Marsha Hanscom, followed by Robert Vandehoek, and then Beth Garland. Marsha, you have the floor. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and with all due respect, Secretary Crowfoot and, and council members, this, my comments are on your sea level rise plan. I wanna direct you again to page seven of your plan. It says, nature-based solutions are the preferred method for sea level rise adaptation. And I wanna specifically hone in on the last part of this other sentence that talks about allowing space for upland and inland migration of coastal habitats. The entire premise that the Biona Wetlands Plan is based on is that they need to somehow take down these upland areas to a lower elevation. Well, that I don't know of any other place on the entire coast here where people are talking about lowering soil levels habitat levels so when in the face of sea level rise does that really make sense that's why we're talking to you about this during your project proposal about sea level rise your plan is good a good plan your overarching goals are very good but how do we translate it to the kinds of projects that the state is spending millions of dollars to try and do the opposite on that's the problem here so uh, with all due respect, Secretary Crowfoot, this is relating to item number seven entirely. Please read those overarching goals and apply them to the Biona Wetlands Project. If you do, if you seriously do, you will want to ask the governor to withdraw the project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is going to be Robert, followed by Beth, and it looks like we may have Phyllis back again. Robert, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Crowfoot and Council. My name is Robert uh, Van de Hoek, and I'm a conservation biologist and applied ecologist. <clears throat> I uh, would like to address climate change from the Southern California Bight region, but um, as I do that, I'd like to remind us that a lot of federal dollars every year is used um, through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to dredge open artificial inlets where there's jetties. And that includes in uh, Northwest California, like Humboldt Bay. I once walked like more than a mile to reach the end of the jetties that reach into the sea and learn that on an annual basis, millions of dollars are spent to keep that open for large boats to come in. It also will allow rising sea levels to come in further inland through those jetty openings. Morro Bay is another example, Elkhorn Slough, 
in the Central Coast and then in Southern California, our LA River. And in our urban areas of Southern California, we have levees that we've built for the stormwater to reach the sea, but uh, the tides and sea level rise can come up those. And I've been noticing over the last uh, 20 years that um, the, the sea level is coming up higher and higher on the edge of the existing levees and walls like in Marina del Rey and the Dominguez River and Los Angeles River. I just need to remind us all that um, these river openings are, are soft bottom and habitat. So like as you heard Marsha Hanscom say under page seven of the nature-based solutions, I think we need to remember to want to keep our existing levees uh, and jetties in Southern California. If we need to ri raise them a little higher in time, that's, that's good, but they're adequate at this time. And to think of them as estuaries, and that's a really f high form of ecology, estuaries under nature-based solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker is going to be Beth, followed by Phyllis, who was the last with their hand up. And Beth, you now have the floor. Hello all, and uh, thank you for this meeting today. Um, I'm a longtime resident of the area and I've seen nature. We have a, a home on Silver Strand and yeah, notice that the, yeah, the, the ocean and things have been rising for a little bit. And, you know, we've gone to Biona for years and, you know, very concerned because we've seen so much, you know, migratory birds and, you know, a lot of wildlife down there. And, you know, this, this bulldozing thing just seems to be a, a plan that's not sensitive to nature and, and the things that live there. I have friends that, you know, have, have been subject to the Malibu restoration and it's totally ruined that area to where, you know, there's no surf down there for surfers that enjoyed the water. A lot of the a lot of the animals, you know, got decimated, and it just, you know, when you see what's what's thriving at Biona, it just makes no sense, especially with the sea level rising, and the risks, you know, to you know, if there were tsunami or other things, there's there'll be no blockage uh, if they bulldoze that 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 ground. So. I just people that are there that know it well that live in that area, you know, a nine year project makes no sense. And I just hope people here on this on this committee can recommend to withdraw that plan because um, a lot of neighbors are very concerned. Thank you for hearing. Thank you. Last speaker is going to be Phyllis. Phyllis, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Phyllis Griffin. I'm the Associate Director of the Sea Grant Program at the University of Southern California, and I'm not going to talk about Biona. Um, what I am going to talk about is, the first of all, commend you on this sea level rise action plan. This is obviously a really important thing for Californians and an issue of great concern to California communities. One thing I'd like to stress is the importance of um, of the local actors uh, in assessing vulnerabilities and developing adaptation plans um, for sea level rise. We have at USC Sea Grant a regional program called Adapt LA that actually stretches between Orange County and Santa Barbara. And what we're trying to do with Adapt LA is to build capacity based on the on current science for coastal communities to develop their local local coastal programs and their adaptation and development plans. So that with the backing of peer reviewed science, they understand um, not only what they're facing, but also what's possible in terms of adaptation planning, in terms of developing living shoreline plans. There are living shoreline plans now in Los Angeles and Santa Monica, in Manhattan Beach and Malibu and, and in Ventura. And these are the core of what is possible for us to do in California and to understand the where the pathways toward effective adaptation lie and what the triggers should be for when communities uh, institute those kinds of plans. So again, I commend you on your report 
and uh, USCC grant stands ready to help in any way we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Well, listen, I'll say that this is a real important step from my perspective. I think you know too many Californians have thought that sea level rise is an issue that we don't have to address now. It's an issue into the future and that it's an issue that only impacts affluent communities uh, and not uh, all manner of communities, including really vulnerable uh, disadvantaged communities. And I think the presentation Ella gave demonstrates that we need to get on it now in partnerships with coastal communities. And this is a matter of protecting vulnerable communities and really all manner of communities along the coast. So I'm excited for this as really an accountability document to identify who's doing what in state agencies. So local communities, conservation organizations, private sector can actually see what the state's doing. And I think that the next several weeks are gonna be important to hear those public comments, to get the, to get the feedback on the plan which is really in many ways hot off the presses. So Mark and team, I'm looking forward to you really doing outreach to the stakeholder community that follows these OPC meetings to solicit input. I think it's really important that our state actions are supportive of the regions, the communities that are along the coast that are, that are facing these challenges. Um, so uh, I look forward to that input. Controller Yee. Thank you, Secretary Crofton. Thank you, Ella and the team. Um, I couldn't agree more about the significance of this report. And um, again, uh, just really grateful for all the work that's gone into it. And um, I think certainly as we have uh, the continued focus on some of our uh, vulnerable disadvantaged communities, um, I just wanted to thank Senator Allen because we are putting down the first foray into addressing that with the bill. Uh, that we will be working on SB 1078, which is um, going to develop the sea level rise uh, revolving loan uh, pilot program. And it is really a statement about uh, not forgetting about these communities. We want to work with local jurisdictions. We want to be sure that uh, we are engaging these communities early, but also evaluating um, and making this a pilot so that we can uh, have this inform our work going forward uh, as well. And these would be loans that would be awarded through the iBank uh, in California. Uh, but um, uh, more importantly, uh, I really appreciate the um, focus on um, uh, overall on equity, which uh, can't be understated. Um, and I, I think as we uh, move forward, and again, this being a working document, I can actually see equity really being embedded in each of the, uh, associated with each of the principles and the action steps that we're gonna be taking. And so as we learn more, and I think that's really part of the communication and also the education that we do. Um, I just look forward to learning really from the communities that are gonna be affected. I think there are uh, one of the best sources of information about how we do move forward in smart ways. Um, this is one of those issues where we have to think about short-term and long-term at the same time. And so um, the more on the ground information we can get, uh, I think it just is all very helpful. So really appreciate the report um, offering us that, uh, that opportunity to, to get that kind of uh, input uh, the last thing I will say is um, I know there's been uh, with the sea level rise um, uh, reports that we've been asking from our uh, local agencies. Uh, I, I hope that uh, we can also uh, just think about how we can improve or lessons learned, I guess, from that effort um, from State Lands Commission about um, just how data there's kind of a quality about data uh, that uh, it really isn't all that effective if we don't have structured metrics and instructions about what we want to see so that we can make comparisons, we can look kind of, uh, you know, uh, cross jurisdiction. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, those lessons can be embedded in the work that we do going forward as well, just from the experience we've had so far. Yeah, really good point. And I'd mentioned thanks to the legislature and the governor, the Coastal Commission has $30 million to provide capacity building for local coastal plans. Uh, and that's gonna be really helpful. I mean, to your point, controller, that you know, we, we really need to make sure that these local plans along the, the coast are aligned with us and vice versa. So um, that's really important. Assembly Member Stone. Thank you. I, I think this is another great example of the this Ocean Protection Council coming together and, and really being a facilitator and a convener on these issues and bringing along the rest of the state agencies. And, and that's, that's excellent to see. 
And for the state to be aligned and have all of the agencies aligned and talking about the same, how we implement given the changes that are coming down is going to be critical. But also local jurisdictions, whether it's a city or a county or a water district or wastewater district, or any of those are really starved in the way that, that California has set up over the decades its revenue structure. They don't have the money for planning. They don't have the money for implementation. So for being able to leverage off of a plan like this and work with local jurisdictions is going to be a critical component ultimately of the success because sea level rise is something that get, can't be done jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It really has to be done region by region, area by area, given the, the specifics of whatever that area is, whether it's it's coastal bluffs or it's lowlands or it's it's uh, estuary systems. And that in, by its nature crosses jurisdictional boundaries. So this is, I think, a very good step in that direction. I look forward to seeing what the public comments are, but I'm also hoping that as this is a living document, we're able to use the, the authority and the financial capacity of the state like the revolving loan or other, other grants to be able to ensure success at the local level, or we're going to have really a, a patchwork of implementation and, and that is not going to serve California in the long run. Yeah, really good point. And I view that, if, you know, future steps are really building the connective tissue between the state and local communities and those jurisdictions, and then really understanding what are the resource needs uh, and other gaps that may exist to help fill them in. I just think, and I think we agree probably that this is a really important cornerstone of really making progress because then there's something for locals to look at in terms of what the state is proposing to, uh, where the state is proposing to take action. So excited about that. This is obviously an informational item, so there's no action that we need to take on that, but would just uh, welcome any, any final thoughts from our council before we move forward with the next item. All right, Jordan. Hey, I thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Uh, just very quickly, I would just add, I think one of the things that I love about this plan is something I like about a lot of the things that OPC puts together, which is creating a foundation for action that is very intentionally meant to be modular and added to. So it's easy to kind of flippantly say it's a living document, but to actually build it in a way where pieces can be filled in and added in. And we don't necessarily have all the funding for implementation, whether it's a revolving loan fund or other yet, but building the pieces that can be fit in. So um, I just really like the way the plan does that and hope we can keep emphasizing that. Really good point. Thanks so much. So Mark and Ella, you will shout from the rooftops that this is completed and open for all manner of input. And then you'll bring an update back to us in June to let us know how that input is going. I also understand that this may be calendared at public meetings of the Coastal Commission and the State Lands Commission for input as well. Yeah, we're really looking forward to working with Betty and State Lands as well as um, Donna and the Coastal Commission on and uh, Larry and BCDC. So to at least um, daylight it um, and really discuss it more with the public in front of those agencies as well. So I think we're going to get a lot of feedback through that process, and we really look forward um, to what we hear from the public. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for all the good work there. Let's move on to uh, item eight, which is a consent item, meaning it doesn't have a presentation that we're planning to give, but certainly one that we can give if any member has questions. This item advances that strategic plan goal of protecting the coast from, from climate change. And it is focused on protecting and restoring coastal and marine ecosystems. And it is the consideration of authorization to disperse funds for the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program. You may remember this fisheries research program is all about monitor, monitoring uh, in the field um, the uh, M MPA performance uh, and supporting sustainable fisheries management. And this specific funding would expand monitoring statewide for the upcoming field season and providing much needed scientific information on MPA performance and again, to support sustainable fisheries management. As background in September of last year, OPC approved $500,000 to this fisheries research program 
to continue monitoring along the central coast for the upcoming 2022 field season with the expectation that the remaining funds would be provided from external sources. However, the outstanding $500,000 to support statewide monitoring wasn't fulfilled, leaving a gap in critically important monitor in, in this critically important monitoring program. This consent item fills this gap. Um, we again have uh, Lindsay Benito, our colleague, who can answer any questions or provide a presentation as needed. Um, if any council member wants to remove this item from the consent calendar to bring it forward to discuss, they're certainly welcome to do so at this point. And if not, I would request uh, consideration of a mo motion to authorize uh, the disbursement of funds for the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program for this 2022 season. So moved. My controller moves. Yes, Jordan Diamond seconds. Jen, please call the roll. Uh, Councilmember Neymark. Aye. Controller Yi. Aye. Councilmember Diamond. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Great, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks so much. So as we near the conclusion of a really productive meeting, we have this important agenda item that I shared earlier, which is the public comment on nine agenda items. Really important that we are a platform or a place where folks who are concerned or interested in any, any topics related to OPC's mission can come and share thoughts. So with that introduction, Holly, we'll turn it over to you to understand uh, or facilitate public comment. Thank you, Secretary Crawford. Um, we're gonna start off with Jennifer Fearing, followed by Amalia Amalda, and then Chris Kay. Jennifer, you have the floor. Good afternoon, um, council members. Jennifer Fearing on behalf of Oceana, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Surf Rider, and the Ocean Conservancy. I just wanted to flag a couple of bills that were listed in the executive director's report that are high priorities for our organizations. First, um, Monterey Bay Aquarium and Surf Rider are very proud to be co-sponsoring Assemblywoman Rebus's AB 1832, the California Seabed Protection Act which would ensure that California joins Oregon and Washington in prohibiting the issuance of mining leases in California's marine waters. And along with the California Fishing Game Warden Supervisors and Manager Association, we also appreciate Assemblymember Bennett's effort with Assembly Bill 2109 to explicitly prohibit luring, chumming, and baiting of white sharks for non-scientific and educational purposes. We look forward to engaging with the administration on these and other ocean-related legislative efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Next speaker is going to be Amalia, followed by Chris Kay, and then Richard Sadowski. Amalia, you have the floor. Amalia, you're on mute. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Dr. Amalia Aruda Almada. I am a science research and policy specialist with the Sea Grant program at the University of Southern California. I'd like to just point to our submitted written comment, which announced that the University of Southern California Sea Grant Program is supporting five research projects during the 2022 to 2024 funding period, funding, pending full federal funding. Uh, these projects were selected from our highly competitive 2021 request for proposals, and they address focal areas in our strategic plan. Um, several focus areas of relevance to OPC including the local impact of DDT on deep sea benthos off Southern California, microplastic fiber toxicity in marine species with different feeding types, enhancing the resilience of underserved coastal communities against compound flooding, evaluating beach restoration to inform nature-based adaptation approaches that enhance coastal resilience and sources and fate of microbial contaminants and coastal watersheds near Los Angeles. So we look forward to sharing the outcomes of these research projects with OPC and stakeholders in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Almada. Next speaker is going to be Chris Kay, followed by Richard. Chris, you have the floor. Chris, you're on mute. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and come back to Chris then, and we will hand it over to Richard Sadowski. Richard, you have the floor. 
Uh, Richard Sadowski, Hello. Home Truck. Hello. Can y'all hear Sorry, me? Sorry, Richard. It looks like Chris came through. I'll call on you for next. Yes. Chris, do you have the floor? Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, my name is Christina Koo, and I am an officer of the Chartered Democratic Party club called Democrats for the Protection of Animals. And our club has voted to support the protection of the Bayona wetlands. And we have sent letters to elected officials to educate them on the ecological realities and the values of the ecological reserve. We do not support the bulldozing of this thriving wetlands. After learning about the facts of the sea level rise threat at coastal areas, uh, specifically the plan includes removing 2 million cubic yards of soil and lowering these coastal lands. Um, this is definitely going to be a threat to the coastal and surrounding areas. And um, I mean, we all clearly understand just the simple physics that when the levees and the creek sides um, are taken away, um, there's no protection. Um, and that's, that's a major cause of uh, concern for all the sea level rise discussion that I think you all had earlier. So by taking away the Biona wetlands, I mean, aren't you doing the opposite of what you all were discussing earlier? It just seems like to lay folks like us who are not ecologists or scientists, that this is just a straightforward physics. Um, so please don't take away all, all this protection that we have, um, you know, the creek size and the levees and um, keep the wetlands there. And so we definitely support the ecological reserve. There's an option for gentle restoration plan that we've read through and um, point by point, they're easy to understand. They make absolute ecological scientific sense. If you haven't seen it, please look at the website, defendbionawetlands.org. It's all there laid out really simple. And um, you know, we would love to, to take those actions instead of taking away the wetlands and you all have the power to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, now you have the floor, Mr. Sadowski. Uh, Richard Sadowski, home front EJ. Um, first and foremost, I, I just want to say that, you know, I appreciate the challenges that, you know, this administration has to, had to deal with, with COVID, the fires, and, and then, you know, and then we're dealing with the climate change. And then on top of that, with the recall and all that other stuff. But, um, some of the things that I want to share with you is some of the challenges our, you know, your foot soldiers have. And, you know, we, we had a, you know, I mentioned our project, which was Morro Bay Estuary Air Monitoring Project, the M-Beam Project. And the challenges that we've had is, I don't know if it's political or what, but, you know, a lot of times when we apply for these grants, they're either funded by water. And then if we go in and get, try to get grants funded by the Air Board, uh, carbon dioxide, which we're monitoring in relation with ocean acidification, isn't a criteria pollutant. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a challenge to try to bring in uh, ocean acidification into an, an environmental justice uh, forum. But, um, and I remember one of the things that um, Commissioner Michael Brown said several years ago is when he was talking and bringing up ocean acidification, nobody ever knew. One of the things that I noticed is uh, when we are out testing with our hand monitor, it creates dialogue. And that's one way how we're educating people on what are you doing and you know, measuring carbon dioxide and then relating it to ocean acidification. And so, you know, if we, you know, one of the things that when we had when we're doing we were doing our project, which we got funded for a monitor, an air monitor, but you know, we were funding the whole time. And the challenges that we're faced with is, you know, losing people. Like, for instance, our colleague couldn't get work, so we had to, we helped him with housing, and now he's going to be moving down to San Diego because there's no work here. So we're losing these people, and and to continue. So, you know, I just want to, you know, share some of the challenges that that you know we we're having out here in in on the front line. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Next speaker is going to be Dan Wolke, followed by Jane Velez Mitchell, and then Walter Lamb. Diane, you have the floor. 
Good afternoon. My name is Diane Wolke. I'm a retired advanced practice nurse and public health nurse living in San Diego County, and I'm a board member for Safe Healthy Playing Fields, a national nonprofit. Um, I wanted to bring up the issue of microplastics pollution related to synthetic turf fields, particularly the used tire crumb that goes in the vast majority of these fields. Currently, there are approximately 30,000 of these fields in the United States with a thousand of them slated to be removed annually. They are not regulated in any state and nobody knows where all of these are. We definitely need to trace and track, which is a, a bill measure that just passed in the Maryland State Legislature this past week. I wanted to point out um, one of the key areas of concern with the tire crumb issue is the 6-PPD, which when, inter when it interacts with, with the ozone creates 6-PPD quinone. And that particular chemical, one, one of 350 chemicals known to be in, <clears throat> excuse me, in used tires, has been found to decimate 96% of the coho salmon population in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Washington state. We also know that it has impacted the Chinook population, which is the primary food source for the 74 remaining orca whales in Puget Sound. We know from the great work of the San Francisco Estuary Institute that, use, that tire crumb represents up to 50% of the microplastics in urban areas. Each one of these playing fields has one to five tons of these microplastics that micro, migrate off the fields each year. And in addition, we know that at the end of their short useful life, there's 440,000 pounds of infill and 40,000 pounds of plastic waste that will be infilled. We need to move quickly to regulate this and I hope that you will work closely with DTSC as they review this issue during their current work plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jane Velez Mitchell followed by Walter Lamb and then Monica Paz Soldan. Jane, you have the floor. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, yes, my name is Jane Velez Mitchell. I'm a journalist, author, filmmaker living near the Bayona wetlands. As a Latina living in Los Angeles, I want to say respectfully, taking a wrecking ball to the Bayona wetlands, LA's last coastal wetlands, is not going to help the underserved Latino community have more access to green space. Quite the contrary, if this bulldozing of the Bayona wetlands happens, kids who are 10 today will be in their 20s before they have access to this area. They could have access today. You can already see that uh, because the recent opening of the Fiji gates due to public pressure has allowed children, marginalized communities, and the public in general to start enjoying this beautiful area, which is teeming with wildlife. People are visiting and they're enjoying nature. Gates to this natural resource had been locked by SoCal Gas, who would be the primary beneficiary of the bulldozing as they urgently seek to upgrade their crumbling gas storage facility under the wetlands. Describing this as a restoration is classic greenwashing. Communities of color and young people are rising up and they're saying forcefully, don't say you're doing this for us because we don't want you to do it. Recently, Genesis Butler, a well-known youth climate activist, led a news conference at the Bayona Wetlands saying, don't hide behind the kids. We don't want another Disneyland. We want to experience nature and see the 1,700 species from owls to foxes to egrets to pelicans who call these wetlands home and have nowhere else to go. If the approximate one square mile is bulldozed and excavated, that would be a massive habitat destruction at a time when we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction and pleading with other nations like Brazil not to destroy their wetlands. So great news. There is an alternative, a detailed 20 point gentle restoration plan. You can see it and study it at defendbionawetlands.org. Please we're, be on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Next speaker is going to be Walter Lamb, who has a PowerPoint presentation that James is going to put up for us. And he is aware of the two minute limit with that. So once the PowerPoint goes up, we'll, there we go. You have the floor, Walter. Walter, you're on mute. There you go. Yep, thank you. Just unmuted. Yeah, I just wanted to, Walter Lamb representing the Bino Islands Land Trust. And I, I wanted to build on some of the positive comments from last meeting. Starting with, you know, expressing appreciation for um, the positive energy that Secretary Crowfoot and so many other state leaders are bringing to these key 
environmental issues, we, we've, we've been seeing that in today's meeting. So specifically, you know, climate resi resilience, biodiversity, <clears throat> and access for all. On the third one, we just made a huge stride forward, you know, working together to get the gates open to area A from Fiji Way and the bike path. And I'm going to show some pictures of that. We, we have some concerns about biodiversity and climate resilience, and I've got some slides on that too. If we go to the next slide, please. So this is um, Alkali Sea Heath. Again, just wanted to thank the Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, Coastal Conservancy for opening those gates. Next slide, please. We have kids, you know, now who are able to access the existing trails in Area A and see some of the native wildlife that we see in the background, the beautiful snowy mountains. Next slide, please. And they were able to look at some things under a microscope that we provided. Um, this green bench was sitting there for six years behind uh, closed gates, so we were happy to give it some use. In the next slide, please. Okay, and another family I bumped into. Next slide, please. Um, this is a northern harrier that photographed just last week. Next slide, please. And a northern flicker, a kind of woodpecker, and one more nature slide, I think. And that's a red-tailed hawk. And if we could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll start to talk about some of the biodiversity and climate resilience. This is Belling Savannah sparrow habitat. You can see where it's centered in the what's called West Area B. Next slide, please. And this is a, a picture um, sort of pre-sea level rise, but after the project is completed. But it, it's a fictional snapshot in time. And I'll show you why if you go to the next slide. Right, you see how that slight change from dark green to yellowish, uh, sorry, lighter green. This is 2030. This is as soon as it's a, it's a nine year project and it's 2022. So even if they started tomorrow, it won't be completed by 2030. So the slide that we just saw is never going to exist. It's going to look Walter, like almost immediately. That is your two minutes. Okay. Thanks. Walter, appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker is going to be Monica, followed by Gabrielle Crow and Marie Baker. Monica, you have the floor. Um, yes, hello, and thank you for giving me some time to speak. I really appreciate the Ocean Council um, existing and the cutting edge work that they're doing. Um, I just wanted to express my concern um, in the in, in the lack of imagination, I think that it is well past time to envision a future without plastic. And I would like to really see the cutting edge work that this council has done to be focusing on a phasing out of plastics in all sectors, um, from textiles to, to packaging of every kind. I don't go anywhere without coming across Amazon plastic uh, seal bags. Um, and as an indigenous weaver, I. I strongly remember the 1990s in uh, my home village in the Andes that I didn't see plastic. I never saw plastic while I was in college there. Um, when I returned 20 years later with my five-year-old son, the river running through that um, area was, was not visible because of the two liter plastic bottles. Um, I just like to uh, close with a quote from James Baldwin is very, very difficult to ask people to give up the assumptions by which they have always lived. And yet that is the demand the world has got to make of everybody now. And I don't know how we could bear to look any child in the eye if we do not do so. I would like to see the council focus on phasing out plastic in the next five years. Otherwise, I don't really see a future. I also hear from, I've worked as a social worker off and on, you know, and in the last five years, I've increasingly got comments from grandmothers trying to do better, who are raising children with, with disabilities caused by all kinds of things. And, and secondhand, they are no longer even able to find cotton clothing for these children. Um, the, the, the availability of natural fibers in the secondhand market is disappearing because of the increasing glut of plastic being pushed into the market, which is only about greed, which is only about greed. So. I would just like to see this council help the world focus more on just eliminating, eliminating the problem. And we'd save so much money. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Okay. Next speaker is going to be Gabrielle Crow, followed by Marie Baker, and then Robert Vandehook. Gabrielle, you have the phone, or Gabrielle, you have the you have the floor. Here you go. 
Niha and good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Gabrielle Crow. I am the vice chair for the Gabrielino Shoshone Tribal Nation of Southern California. I'm also an educator with the Biona Wetlands Land Trust. I wanted to attend this meeting to express my gratitude for the public access that has been granted at area A of the Biona Wetlands. I was actually able to visit the area with my parents and children this last Saturday. I would also like to continue a dialogue with your council and my tribal council um, as far as tribal representation and future projects and discussing sea level rise in the Biona wetlands. I know that it may be difficult at times for, for your council to make connections with tribal councils, but I'm willing and able to work with your organization and I would love to talk to your tribal liaison. So I thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, Gabrielle. And our, our tribal liaison is, is uh, named Geneva E. B. Thompson, and um, and the members of, or the staff of the Ocean Protection Council can can connect you with her. Next speaker is going to be Marie Baker, followed by Roberts, and then I have Steve Antle, who's raised and lowered his hand about ten times now, so he may be third. And Marie, you have the floor. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, on, the, in, on behalf of the wildlife, the 1,700 different species that exist at the Bayonela wetlands. Traditionally and historically, we have found that we in, when we intervene with nature, it does not turn out well for us or for the wildlife or for the ecosystem. I believe that if it were left alone, it would be sufficient to recover on its own path in its own time and that we should not intervene with this last piece of wildlife this last vestige of untouched land why must we go in with our progress and our uh, agendas for making money which it always seems to come down to and the animals and the wildlife and the ecosystem is the last Thing on the agenda to consider. And that is why we are in the situation that we are now with possibilities of these species not existing for our children, which will have a devastating effect on their future. Please do not bulldoze the Biona wetlands. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Next speaker is going to be Robert, followed by Steve and then Mary Beth Trotwain. Robert, you have the floor. Thank you very much and for the opportunity to speak for, I think, the third time in public uh, comments, uh, in general public comments now. Uh, I'm Robert Von de Hook, and I am a, a scientist, I'll just say generally an environmental scientist and educator, and I was very pleased to hear uh, Gabrielle Crow speak. Uh, she is not only an indigenous a person of a Southern California tribe, but she's an environmental educator scientist herself. and. The associated, she's with, with Walter Lamb and the Myona Lutton's Land Trust, who gave you a brief PowerPoint of some features. And where you saw the northern harrier and the woodpecker and the children with the microscope, just beyond that is the levee wall of Bayona River Estuary. And there, there's rowing that takes place. Uh, virtually every day of the year from three different universities, uh, colleges. And so there's all this recreation potential and the estuary uh, is, is very important there. And any functioning estuary needs to have uplands and um, sand dunes as part of an estuary to be a system. Uh, Santa Monica Bay is called an estuary uh, under the National Estuary Project. And my uh, chuckle there was that Santa Monica Bay is protected open coast and outer open coast. And just a quick few seconds on what is an estuary. The three major parts of the definition of an estuary are that uh, there needs to be fresh water mixing with water. Two, there needs, the water needs to be shallow and warm. And third, there needs to be no wave action. So Santa Monica Bay is not, an, is not a national estuary, but Bayona River is an estuary, as is Marina del Rey, an urban man-made estuary. And I think that we need to like look at the whole ecosystem uh, more uh, collectively, including uh, not just Bayona wetlands, but the entire surrounding area. 
Thank you. Next speaker is going to be Steve Antel, followed by Mary Beth, who is our last commenter for the day. Steve, you have the floor. Steve, you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I'll try to make this quick because I know we're all tired. My name is Dr. Steve Antel. For the past four years, I've been working on a cost-effective washer microplastic fil filtration system to 50 microns and a way to extend the filter life. Um, I want to really appreciate, let you guys know the statewide macro microplastic strategy that OPC has been drafting. And I also want to uh, thank Assemblyman Stone for all his efforts the past three years to draft legislation for washer filtration. Uh, unfortunately, in 2020, Dr. Stone or Assemblymember Stone's bill never received a hearing. 2021, along with uh, Friedman, that bill did not get a hearing and just recently drafted 2022, number 1952, um, that still has to come with a hearing. And I would like to see if somehow people can strategize a way so that we can go ahead and have a hearing of Assembly Member Stone's 2022 um, legislation regarding microplastic uh, filtration. Uh, because supposedly it's going to occur in 2024, but if it doesn't happen this year, we're getting really short on time. Thank you so much for all your activities and all your uh, efforts for a statewide microplastic strategy. Thank you, Steve. Next speaker is going to be Mary Beth Trotwin, and she is the last commenter who hasn't already spoken today for this action item. Mary, you have the floor. Hello, my name is Mary Beth Trotwine. I'm a resident of Venice and my comment today is thank you. Thank you to Secretary Crowfoot and the Ocean Protection Council for your work. Also, I wanna talk about Area A of Bayona Ecological Reserve. Many speakers have called in to say thanks and I am too. Um, the opening of Area A expands equitable recreational access to this precious, precious natural area. And this is a key priority for the Natural Resources Agency and the OPC. Obviously, LA is an intensely urbanized area. Area A of the Bayona Ecological Reserve with its location along the county bike path and next to the marina gives Angelinos the opportunity to enjoy this unique coastal wetland. You saw pictures of it earlier with Walter's uh, presentation. Um, area A of the Bayona Ecological Reserve also contains four SoCal gas wells. As the Department of Fish and Wildlife acknowledged, this public area was closed for six years so that SoCal gas could operate and maintain these wells. Um, I would also like to thank member Ben Allen who wrote to the Department of Conservation two and a half years ago, calling for a feasibility study of the long-term viability of the SoCal gas Playa del Rey gas storage facility in Los Angeles with an idea to decommission the site. The gas storage site on the ocean's edge currently contributes greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and in turn to sea level rise, a subject of much time today. In light of these recent reports about the acceleration of sea level rise and the OPC's hard work on its sea level rise plan, I ask with urgency to reconsider the Department of Fish and Wildlife's restoration project, which is not in sync with current sea level rise predictions. Thank you for considering to end the restoration of the Bayona wetlands as proposed by the DFW. Thank you, Mary Beth. Well, thanks to all the members of the public and partners outside of government that joined us for this meeting. We, we accomplished a lot in three and a half hours, including uh, hearing about and approving the first microplastic strategy in the world, hearing about uh, and discussing our first comprehensive action plan across state agencies on sea level rise, and then getting more 
important funding out the door for activities that are part of our strategic plan. Big thanks to you all uh, on the council who continue to lead on this issue. Controller Yi, welcome back. Uh, thanks as always to Senator Allen and Assemblymember Stone for being our champions on these issues in the legislature. And big thanks to Mark and Jen and team for more progress. Our next meeting will be in June. Cross fingers, we will have uh, an in-person meeting, uh, quite possibly with an online option. We'll have, to, we'll have to figure that out in the brave new world of moving back to normal-ish. Uh, but I know it would be a great pleasure to, to be all be together if possible. In the meantime, the work continues. Once again, thanks everybody, and we'll talk again soon.